Assalamualaikum and a very good morning I bid to the honorable judges, teachers, guests, participants and everyone present. Welcome all to the live streaming of the 9th online Fully Residential Schools International Symposium 2021. What a blessing it is to have our event on such a lovely day. Ladies and gentlemen, before we embark on today's journey, let me give you a brief introduction of our symposium. The Fully Residential Schools International Symposium, or FIRSIS, was initiated in 2011 and was organized by the Ministry of Education Malaysia under the Fully Residential Schools Management Division in partnership with the National Commission for UNESCO Malaysia. Through a systematic research and creation of video presentations on cutting edge issues, we hope to instill the culture of critical thinking, decision making, as well as creativity amongst the youth. In line with this event objectives, our aim is to nurture towering personalities as well as leadership qualities for our leaders of tomorrow. You are all cordially invited to watch the presentations on the sub-theme COVID-19, the rise of digital revolution, and later have a chance to pose any questions to the presenters. Shamim, I was informed, it is not only the participants who are presenting in this event can get an International Achievement e-certificate. The audiences can too by participating in our online quiz. Is that true? Yes, Hana, it is. For the audience information, there is an online quiz that will be posted in the chat box at the end of the first session on both days, today and tomorrow. We have different sets of questions for our online quizzes according to the tracks. If you manage to answer 80% of the questions correctly, you will be rewarded with an International Achievement e-certificate. Make sure to be on the lookout for the quiz. As planned for today, we will have 14 teams overall to present their research videos. However, in this session, we are going to look at the presentations from the first five teams. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to invite our three esteemed judges who come from various schools and institutions. Our chief judge for today is Mr. Nick Zahir bin Nick Muhammad Hidris. He is a vice president too from Society of Vibration and Acoustic Malaysia. Meanwhile, our second judge is Ms. Nurul Fazlina binti Badul Zaman from Sekolah Menengah Sultan Abdul Halim. And lastly, our third and final judge is Ms. Amaria Lopez from Sekolah Menengah Sains Sabah. We would like to welcome all judges to our live streaming today. I, Shami Binti Harun, and my co-moderator, Hana Atikah Binti Zul Hazami, are both from Sekolah Sri Putri Saberjaya. Welcome and thank you so much for being here with us today. Shamim, I'm sure we would not want to make our audiences wait for too long. Shall I read the rules? Number one, the presentation must focus on the sub-theme assigned to each team. The sub-theme for this track is COVID-19, the rise of digital revolution. Number two, the duration of the video presentation should not be more than 10 minutes. And number three, question and answer session will be conducted after each presentation. To start the ball rolling, let us call upon Liana Hazikah binti Abdul Razak and Sashina Suari anak perempuan cantran from Sekolah Menengah Sains Seri Putri with us today. Let us all watch their video presentation entitled The Acceleration of Digital Revolution During COVID-19 Pandemic Puts Earth at Risk. Please welcome. We are representatives from Siri Kutri Science Institute. We'll be explaining our research on the acceleration of the digital revolution during the COVID 19 pandemic that was put at risk for the ninth fully residential school international symposium at our SSS. 2021. Our team members are Liana Hazika, Nur Iman Matrisha, Fatin Umaira, Sashine Suri, and our supervising teacher is Ms. Duratun Nakia Binti Muhammad Khalil. <laughs> Have you ever 
wondered what is the definition of digital revolution? Well, digital revolution is the shift from mechanical and analog electronics technology to digital electronics that began in the later half of the 20th century with the adoption and proliferation of digital computers and digital record keeping that continues to the present day. Now, let's dig in deeper. Have you ever thought about the consequences of the rise of the digital revolution? Without us knowing, the digital revolution has been secretly killing our environment by polluting our mother nature. So, what actually is digital pollution? Well, digital pollution includes all sources of environmental pollution produced by digital tools. Digital pollution has provoked an impact to the society, but up until now, it is not recognized as a form of pollution. Now, why is the issue regarding digital pollution important? This is because our planet Earth is currently facing a disastrous environmental pollution that has caused grave danger to our precious Mother Nature, such as digital carbon footprint. There are a few objectives that we would like to achieve from our research. Our first objective is to investigate how the accelerating digital revolution during pandemic contributes to digital pollution. Second is to raise people's awareness about the environmental disaster that happened because of digital pollution nowadays. Last but not least is to suggest what can be done to reduce the number of digital pollution. The question is, how does digital revolution contribute to digital pollution? Therefore, we have discovered three main drivers of this issue. First, manufacturing of devices. Device manufacturer is a vendor that creates one or more physical devices such as machining, transportation and material sourcing that are then sold to end users which are us humans. Second, digital pollution is also caused by humans' daily practices. For instance, when we use our electronic devices, open servers on the internet, and the existence of data centers. Lastly, it's because of the huge amount of e-waste, such as a rubbish dump and the plan of silence. Moving on with our target audience, we discussed thoroughly and decided that our target audiences are working adults and students. Before we begin our research, we definitely need evidence that shows how many people are not aware of this rising issue. To continue with, a set of questionnaires was distributed among 60 students and 50 working adults. The first question asked was on their consideration of being a heavy internet user proves that the majority of the respondents contribute to digital pollution. Next, this question relates to the topic of device manufacturing. Many have bought new devices during lockdown. This means that there is a high demand on device manufacturing, which requires plenty of material sourcing. The next questions are related to the topic of practices. From this pie chart, it indicates that many are using multiple devices at the same time instead of relying on one device only. Meanwhile, 50% of the respondents spend their time on digital platforms for more than 7 hours due to their respective reasons. From this graph, it tells us that the people spend their time on digital platforms mainly for their survival during lockdown. And last but not least, these next questions are related to the topic of emails. This pie chart tells us that most of the respondents keep their discarded devices at home rather than recycling or selling them for better use. If this activity continues, people tend to discharge unused devices and this can potentially lead to toxic chemicals from metals to leach. What can we do to counter this problem? Don't worry, there are a few alternatives and mechanisms provided by us to combat digital pollution. Solution number one. You will need to manage your emails better. First of all, you can unsubscribe from all newsletters that you don't read instead of keeping them as shown in the video. Second, avoid sending pointless messages and check your emails first before sending it in order to avoid the notorious follow-up. 
instead of sending emails to check with the person, it is much more encouraged to use an internal messaging tool, such as Slack, as it consumes less energy than emails. Next, you can use an anti-spam tool and regularly empty your recycle bin and spam folder. You can do this once every month. Lastly, whenever you have to send a large file to someone, choose a file hosting service that uses a download link on a website. For instance, you can use Google Drive. Moving on, eliminate superfluous use of technology. Disconnect whenever you can, if your work allows it. You don't have to spend all day connected to social networks. When you are at home, unplug your modem or router at night and when you're away to save electricity. Remove unused applications and delete your old account that you no longer use. They are still stored on servers and create pollution for nothing. Thirdly, we must optimize our use of devices. The first thing you can do to optimize your use of devices is by choosing devices suited to your needs. Be precise on what kind of device that you're looking for and make sure it's less power consuming. Secondly, a visit to the repairer is very recommended before committing to any replacement of your equipment. Thirdly, remember to always switch your devices to power safe mode to make the need to charge your devices less often. Last but not least, Please recycle your old electronics by sending them to a recycling program. Do my dad a favor and help us to save the environment. Use your browser better. Use eco-responsible search engines such as Lilo or Ecosia to reduce your carbon footprint. Next, use bookmarks to avoid repeating identical searches. By doing so, it allows the reduction of internet access. Be precise when you search. If the keyword you use is the right one, you will save the energy needed to travel about 40 kilometers, which is 24.8 miles by car. Don't forget to close the tabs you are not using. This is due to the fact that they are able to cause excess usage of the internet, which will lead to digital pollution. Lastly, type directly in the navigation bar instead of the search engine in order to provide greater search visibility. As you can see here, if you type in the search engine, you will need to scroll down to find the right website. On the other hand, if you type in the navigation bar, there is a possibility that it will lead you directly to the website of your choice. Lastly, practice rational streaming. It is much advisable to disable automatic video playback and reduce the quality of streams. Low definition streaming is much more effective in practicing rational streaming. Activate Wi Fi instead of consuming videos via the 4G network, as the 4G network is known to be energy intensive. As an addition, we recommend you to use a cache system which allows reduction in internet access. On the whole, this research has its own advantages and disadvantages that will affect the relevance of this research on our current world amidst the pandemic. The first advantage of this research is that awareness could be raised and the world community could be educated more on digital pollution and its impact on our world. As this research mainly focuses on the digital revolution and its impact on our world, the world community, especially the target audiences, would be familiar with digital pollution and how it can affect our world in the long run. The second advantage is this research will have the aptitude to cultivate people on ways of combating digital pollution. The solutions and mechanisms provided are suitable in application of our daily lives. Hence, there is little to no major inconvenience in changing our daily habits in favor of reducing digital pollution. The third advantage of this research is to ensure a safer environment while proceeding towards a digitally revolutionized world. The balance of a healthy environment is as important as accelerating the digital revolution towards a better future for humankind. The last but not least of an advantage by conducting this research is the efficiency of mechanisms proposed could be constructive and functional on a larger scale. As the methods and mechanisms provided to combat digital pollution are practical and easy to be applied in our daily lives. As mentioned earlier, there will also be two disadvantages to this research. The first disadvantage is the delay in forming a digitally revolutionized world. There will be a delay in our future as more and more people will know about the impact of digital pollution. Hence, slowing down the process of digital revolution is ensuring a safer environment. The second disadvantage is the routine of combating digital pollution might not align with daily practices of some target audiences.
as dependency on digital aids differs from person to person, the way of combating digital pollution could not be generalized. With that, we thank you. I'm sure we are all amazed by the excellent video presentation from Sekolah Menengah Sains Sri Putri. Such an interesting topic must leave some of you wondering as to how, what, and why. Clear your heads and insert your questions in the live chat. We also would love to welcome our esteemed judges back on board. Okay, so firstly, we have a question from user Nur Aina Farina bin Tiruslan. Uh, the inquiry reads as, do you think people will be interested in this topic? Why? Can our presenters kindly answer? Uh, in my opinion, uh, the people who would be interested in this topic is something that is not known by the outside world and it will be a an advantage for a person to you know this kind of knowledge as it's a leading point to a person and it could be beneficial in some essays as it requires topic about uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback. Moving on, there is an inquiry from user Hasha Maryam. They ask, do you think teenagers nowadays are aware of this issue? Our presenters, please help clear the air. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, in my opinion, I feel like uh, most teenagers nowadays are slightly not aware of this issue because they don't see it affecting our environment or our, world, our current world in a larger scale. So that's why we came up with this research so that it can um, provide you know, alternatives and also knowledge to people out there, especially teenagers, on how this um, issue affects our world. Thank you. A spectacular delivery of justification. I'm sure the individual who asked is also satisfied with the answer. Do we have any more questions from the audience? If there are any more questions, please do not hesitate and drop them in the chat box. Our presenters are glad to answer them. Okay, uh, well, um, is it okay for me to talk? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah. I have a suggestion. Okay, actually, I like the presentation, um, especially on the last part of the presentation where you give some solutions, right, on how you can actually uh, de uh, decrease the footprints. So, but uh, on the on the initial part, uh, is I think it's best if you can actually uh, give some better illustration on uh, and stress on the impact of digital resolution in five to ten years time. For example, like uh, you know, uh, increase in carbon footprint. Uh, you know, data servers will be increased. Just show show the pain and you know what's going to happen in another five to ten years time. You know, like uh, increase in device manufacturing will actually uh, increase more devices. People tend to buy more data storage, which incurs money. And then uh, search time will be long. So then, then you can actually link to to your solutions. So from uh, the the initial I see is um, not tell you much on that lah. So so uh, how how do you experience you know uh, your online classes during the pandemic? Do you do you use a lot of um, video streamings and all? Yes, especially since we are students, we um, are really, I think, really, uh, really uh, for yes. Would our presenters want to continue the answer? Okay, thank you so much for the response. Do we have any more questions or maybe um, the other judges want to give more commentaries on the video presentation? Do we still have time? Yes, okay, have time. Uh, I might have a question. Can I have a question? Yes. Can I pose a question? Okay. Yes. Um, just, just to, um, just share with us. Uh, is there any limitations in your project while doing your research? Any limitation that you have while doing your research? Um, for me, uh, there's um, 
the limitation in our research, research is that when we need to edit the video, the um, application for us to make it a better a quality video is kind of hard because we have online classes and we have to record our video. So the uh, time consuming is very mine. Um, I could say that uh, it's a good research and it will be really beneficial to people out there. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent um, answer, presenter. So to the audience, do you have any more questions? We still have um, some time. So we have a question from user Afifa Zulkarnain. They're curious, what inspired you to choose this topic in particular? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, from our opinion, what inspired us to choose this topic in particular is um, basically our relation with uh, internet and digital revolution today, because we can say that we live in an era that, um, you know, internet and everything digital is something that we are familiar with, but what we are not actually familiar with is how it can affect us in the long run. So that is what inspired us to choose this topic in particular, so that we can educate ourselves and people around us more on how it can affect us. Thank you. An interesting commentary. Shirley has given me some new matter to ponder upon. All right, that concludes our question and answer session for Sekolah Melengah Sains Sri Putri. Thank you so much to our presenters, Yana Hazika and Sashi Naswari for the great presentation and for clearing the air for the audience and for the judges. We also would like to thank the judges for the questions and positive feedback that has surely give us, given some guidance to the presenters. Shamim, do you know how many schools are here with us today? As far as I know, this year's thesis has received participate, participation from, from countries such as India, Thailand, Turkey, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. This year, a total of 105 international participants have come together in this auspicious event. In addition, the total number of participants is around 470 students, comprising all 70 fully residential schools nationwide. To name a few, there are participants from Sekolah Tuan Ku Abdul Rahman, Sekolah Menengah Sains Miri, the Malay College, Sekolah Menengah Sains Jeli, the Royal Military College, Sekolah Baksrama Penuh Integrasi Selandar, and many others. I'm happy we have so many schools participating in Versus this year. Shall we move on to the next school? Yes, yeah, sure. Carrying on with the symposium, I would like to invite Nur Farahin Amira, Binti Hashim and Muhammad Adam Fikri bin Halmi from Sekolah Menengah Sains Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah. Let's enjoy their well-prepared video presentation entitled My Zatra Harnessing the Digital Revolution in Combating COVID-19 in Malaysia. Please welcome. <laughs> Sustainable Development Goals. We is a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. Sustainable Development Goals has a total of 17 goals, but up to date, our main focus is SGD9, Industry, Innovation and Infrastructure. In the subtopic of Digital Revolution, followed by our title, My Sejahtera Harnessing Digital Revolution in Combating COVID-19 in Malaysia. Before we proceed, I want to be clear about the SDG9. As I said before, SDG9 is one of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
that we tended to achieve by 2030. It aims to build a resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. So, why is SDG 9 is important to build a better world? It is because SDG 9 will open more job opportunities, making the economic growth increase and lessening the income poverty. COVID-19 is an infectious disease that will discover in Europe and China during the later of the pandemic. After a year of wide spreading, the World Health Organization WHO declared the outbreak of public health emergency of international concern and international concern on the January year and pandemic on March 11, 2002. During the pandemic, people were urged to stay at home in order to have a self-sectors again the possibility of infection. Several symptoms of people with COVID-19 are included as dry cough, difficulty of breathing, fever, or chill. This disease transmits when people breathe in the air contaminated by droplets and tiny particles. This infection alone has been estimated to have recorded over 4.54 million deaths in only two years of spreading, making it a deadly pandemic condition. I believe everyone has been wondering why it's actually MySketch. MySketch is an application developed by Malaysian government to assist in monitoring COVID-19 outbreak in the country to empower users to assess the health risk of being infected of this virus. The app which was launched on April 20 was aimed at monitoring COVID-19 management in Malaysia. The purpose of the data collection based on the information you provided on your health condition, MySketch, Close contact with a confirmed case in case your health condition requires a follow up with a healthcare personnel and also helping you identify whether your current location is a hotspot area and most importantly, it to trace you, the place you have been in case there's a positive COVID 19 case reported. As so you know, nowadays, checking in with my center is a requirement when you are away from one's home. This shows the need of my center in our daily life as a compulsory because every sector in Malaysia is using my center. In Malaysia, my center is widely used for the purpose of population surveillance, case identification, contact tracing, and evaluation of interventions of basics of mobility data and communication with the public. We have conducted a survey to see the response and perspective of Malaysians in effectiveness of MySedatra in combating COVID-19 in Malaysia. We have received over 200 responses from all around the country. Our survey consists of 15 sets of questions which cover demographic perceptions, the positive and the negative, of the apps as well as opinion about the tracking app. We have received a balanced number of respondents from urban and rural areas. Our respondents vary in age from 13 to 65 years old, with more female respondents than male answering the form. From the survey, 99% of our respondents have my suggestion installed on their phone. The remaining don't have the app because they don't own a smart device. However, all respondents believe that MySedatra should be a compulsory app to have on their own device. From our survey, we found out that 73% of users use all of the functions in MySedatra to track their hotspot location, register for vaccination, as well as to check their risk of being infected by the virus. The remaining 27%, however, only use MySedatra for the check in function. We found out that all respondents actually agree that MySetra is actually an effective tool to be used to combat COVID-19. As the virus is spread by close contact among people, MySetra can be detect potential outbreak in any area and still quicker and more effective can be measured. MySetra has now become one of the important things needed in mm -hmm. The facilities that have been provided facilitated the life of the users. The use of my suggestion in the life of the community has also shown an enchantment. The community has begun to practice the use of my suggestion and now show positive effect. Mm -hmm. research also shown that according to data released by the health ministry, more people check in with the my suggestion application 
during the stages of lockdown than during the movement control of the MCO 3.0 period. This slide that it shows that about 4% of the total COVID-19 cases recorded were detected directly via the self-help assessment function in the master doctor. More than half of them find master doctor useful to check the latest standard operating procedure for their daily activities or to get virtual health advice and to take the behavioral reasons. Master doctor, more or less, has been really useful for this couple of years. But the question is much more complex. How far do you think my suggestion can go in the future? Instead of just a contact tracing application alone, my suggestion can be elevated to an active health related operating system. With that being said, they should allow in the access to the healthcare provider from only licensed pharmacies or clinics for medicinal supplies or potatoes. In addition to this, people with impaired health will be able to keep on track of their shadow appointment throughout the app. For example, people shall facilitate the access of treatment by attending healthcare personnel upon admission into a hospital under the monitoring of the responsible doctor or specialist. Furthermore, dissemination of health information should not be geographically bound, but also accessible across borders, especially for frequent travelers locally or internationally. Malaysia has now advanced in practicing the use of digital revolution in daily life, which brings our country to in line with leading countries in controlling the spread of COVID-19. It is also hoped that the use of the digital revolution can be expanded to provide a better management of COVID-19 and a sustainable life. Based on the data received and collected, we can prove that MySjatra harnessing digital revolution in combating COVID-19 in Malaysia all the benefits stated before already reinforced the points mentioned. We hope that the use of Masjatra will be developed in the life of community to create a better and more sustainable life for all. To sum up, Masjatra is an excellent application that tremendously helps Malaysia combat COVID-19. Utilizing all the features in the app, we are sure that the long battle with COVID-19 will soon come to its end. Hopefully, by being able to track contact, report symptoms, as well as facilitate vaccinations, we will be able to mitigate the virus in Malaysia. MySjatra is a perfect example of using digital revolution under SDP9 in combating the spread of COVID-19. Surely, while we are all devastated by the virus since the first time it was discovered, we can still strive and take advantage of the presented situation to close the gap in communication technology by bringing people closer together despite having to apply social distancing with each other to together hand in hand put an end to this pandemic. As much as we have to suffer losses during this difficult time, we still enjoy some gains and thus making the world we live in a better place. What a brilliant video presentation by Sekolah Menengah Sains Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah. However, the audience must have a lot of questions for the presenters. Do not let your curious minds stay silent and please leave your questions in the chat box. Let us also have the judges back at the studio to accompany our question and answer session. Okay, so firstly, we have from user Aina Zaina. They are asking, in your opinion, what can be improved from the MySjatra app? Our presenters, please help clear the app. Mm. Yes, can everyone hear? Yes, presenter, we can hear you clearly. Um, in our opinion, what can be improved from the master Jatra application is um, master Jatra application can help in supplying medication. Personally, my brother has a disease, so it's very hard for my brother to go to hospital every month. So why don't you improve the master Jatra application that can uh, supply the medication through online and deliver it using the uh, express transport and is that all yes 
All right. Thank you so much for the amazing feedback. The next question is from user Nur Alia Erdina. They are curious, how did you come up with the idea of involving the My Sejahtera app? Shall we have the presenters to address this issue? Um, okay. Um, we actually got the idea to involve My Sejahtera. Am I clear? Yes, we can hear your voice. Okay. Um, um, we first came up with My Sejahtera app uh, because of SDG 9 are likely related to innovation, fostering innovation, which uh, which is related to um, communication. So I think the main point of we uh, including my sejahtera in our thesis is for to deliver how does my sejahtera play roles in in strengthening pandemic management. I think that's all for me. That was a really good explanation, presenter. Thank you for the response. Do we have any more questions? All right, so the next question um, from uh, user Nur Aina Fariha. They are asking, what is one of the biggest challenge that you had to face while completing the research? Um, um, what's one of the biggest challenge that, you, that we face while completing the research? Um, so basically is time because we have a lot of classes and we have to attend and then we have to divide the time to proceed our research and then um, sometimes uh, one of my members doesn't have the good quality of internet then they do, they cannot um, discuss with us uh, discuss with us and then cannot do his part so it's very difficult and then um our arrangement of time is not quite good but we tried our best so our biggest challenge is time mm. an amazing response as expected thank you very much Okay, now can we have our judges please pose a few questions or give a few comments to our presenters? All right, may I? Yes, sure. All right, uh, from your research, you mentioned about uh, many of us, I mean, most of us have installed the MySejahtera, correct? But some still have not, correct? So, um, yes. in your opinion, what kind of suggestion or recommendation that you can suggest to overcome the issue for those who have not installed the um, my sejahtera uh, right so as we know that when has uh the company b40 or helping the B40 family of M40 family and there are also the telecom uh, company that supply a uh, very cheap smartphone as for myself I use the cheap smartphone which is 140 ringgits and the other is 360 ringgits which is very cheap than other uh, smartphone so I think everyone can get the smartphones so there is no exception to this all All right, thank you, presenters. Nur Farahin Amira binti Hashim and Mama Adam Fikri bin Halili from Sekolah Menengah Sains Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah for the great presentation and for addressing the questions from the judges and the audience. We also would like to thank the judges for accompanying us throughout this question and answer session. Well, Hannah, do you know about FISIS vision? The vision for FISIS is to create world-class leaders. 
Consequently, Persis has always been a platform to develop effective leaders who are not only aware of the current issues, but are also able to apply their knowledge in solving problems effectively. With the participation of students from all around the world, we are always aiming to create a significant impact in molding global leaders with towering personalities and improving leadership skills. Wow, that was so interesting. I hope both audience and participants gain new insights from today's event. So next up, welcome on board our next presenters, Nur Amira binti Cik Azaharuddin and Ainur Alia binti Salman from Sekolah Menengah Sains Hulu Terengganu to proceed with their video presentation on COVID-19, a catalyst for digital revolution to resume today's event. Let's enjoy. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. I beg to the judges and all. My name is Ain. I'm Amira. My name is Nick. And my name is Aiman. Today, our team, ACES, from SM Science Sulu Terengganu, will be presenting our research titled COVID-19, A Catalyst for Digital Revolution. Without further ado, let's begin by looking at our problem statement. Rapid advancement of technology has led us to the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution increases the demand of highly qualified graduates in various industries of the law at all 2020. Hence, as the agent of change and the backbone of the nation, it is imperative for students to be adequately prepared to meet the demands of the changes driven by the digital revolution. Despite being digital natives, students were reported to be ill-prepared with the digital knowledge and skills to survive in their digital futures. Khan et al. 2021. Tang et al. 2019 also highlighted the lack of soft skills among Malaysian graduates. Arguably, the COVID-19 pandemic is perceived as a catalyst for the digital transformation among the students. Therefore, this research attempted to determine the use of digital technologies among the Form 4 students of SM Science Sulu Terengganu during the COVID-19 pandemic. It further explored how the use of digital technologies affected the students specifically in terms of the soft skills acquired. In order to obtain the data to provide answers for our research, 18 online questionnaires were distributed and 4 students were interviewed. Our research findings will be discussed based on the two research objectives. First, we will look at the use of digital technologies among the respondents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, we will discuss further on the respondents' development of skills through the use of digital technologies during the pandemic. The use of digital technologies. First and foremost, respondents reported increased use of digital technologies compared to the past. 67.5% of the respondents spent more than 5 hours on digital technologies per day during the pandemic. The respondents' active engagement with digital technologies during the pandemic can be seen in various aspects of their life, particularly education, social interaction, healthcare, entertainment, and lifestyle. Ninety-five point one percent of the respondents search for learning materials. Ninety-six point three percent prepare for and submit classroom presentations, projects, and assignments. 93.8% agreed that they use digital technologies to hold group discussions with teachers and friends. It is worth noting that the respondents' adoption of online learning also leads to the discovery of new online educational technologies like Google Meet, Zoom, Google Jamboard, Canva, and others. Our search had indicated that 91.3% all the respondents frequently use social media like WhatsApp, Instagram, and Twitter to keep in touch with others. This corroborates the Internet User Survey IUS 2020 carried out by Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission MCMC, 
during the COVID-19 pandemic, where 98.1% of internet users go online to communicate via text and for social networking. In addition to academic purposes, the respondents in our research also creatively use video conferencing applications like Google Meet, Zoom, and Discord for other social purposes such as to celebrate birthdays and digitally watch movies together. Since the start of the MCO, the respondents have taken proactive steps by embracing healthcare technology to maintain a healthier lifestyle during the pandemic. In addition to the MySgestro application launched by the government, 80% of our respondents agree that they rely on health and fitness applications available at their disposal to keep track of their health and fitness. Digital technologies have played a significant role in helping the respondents cope with the pain of being in social isolation. 85% of the respondents use digital technologies to seek for online entertainment like playing online games, watching movies on online platforms such as Netflix, View, and Tonto. Apart from that, it is not worrying that the respondents also use digital technologies to engage in online shopping. This corroborates Isa Eta, who in the study found out that most online shoppers in Malaysia are student age between 15 to 24 years old. In our research, apart from satisfying their consumption needs, online shopping is also perceived as a coping mechanism among the respondents during the MCO period. The development of skills. Granke et al. emphasized the importance of strengthening not only technical skills but also non-cognitive and socio-emotional skills in order to thrive in the digital transformation. Our research has also taken into account the development of skills among the respondents through their engagement with digital technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic. The findings have shown that the use of digital technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the improvement of the respondent skills, namely critical thinking and problem solving skills, collaboration skills, communication skills, and the last one is learner autonomy. 90% of the respondents agreed that their engagement with digital technology has enabled them to develop their critical thinking and problem solving skills. They need to analyze and evaluate the sources of information they obtain from the internet has led them to improve their critical thinking skills. Moreover, the respondents believed that the existence of technology has made it easier for them to find a new way to solve a problem. This is supported with Katahira, which revealed how the use of digital learning platforms are in developing students' reasoning, problem solving, and decision making skills. Next is collaboration skills. 86.2% of the respondents revealed that their collaboration skills have improved through the use of digital technologies, especially during online learning. Digital learning platforms are perceived as an effective medium that allows them to experience and practice virtual teamwork skills as they engage in meaningful discussion and collaborative activities with their classmates. Spencer 2020 highlighted that collaborating with their classmates enable the students to discover new ideas and approaches to solve problems. 70% of the respondents agreed that their use of digital technologies during the pandemic has played a significant role in improving their communication skills. Apart from their collaboration with others during online learning and the use of social media, online gaming also serves as a great platform for them to improve their communication skills by communicating with their teammates. Collins and Halverson, 2018, stressed the importance of young people to be able to communicate with diverse audience through the media in order to survive in the era of digital revolution. As online learning is seamless and can take place anytime and anywhere, it has enabled the respondents to develop learning autonomy as they take ownership of their own learning. Fatiba Chakul and Bunma, 2020, emphasize learning autonomy as a prerequisite for learning effectiveness 
as it allows students to develop critical thinking and learning responsibility. As mentioned by the respondents, the opportunity to use digital technologies gives them a sense of freedom to choose learning materials that suit their learning styles and needs. In fact, being able to collaborate with others through technologies also allows them to self-direct their own learning. Our research has successfully shown how the COVID-19 pandemic acts as a catalyst for digital revolution among the respondents. In other words, it can be concluded that digital technologies have completely revolutionized the respondents' life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, our findings have also revealed how the use of digital technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the development of soft skills among the students thus making them sufficiently equipped with the knowledge and skills to survive in this ever-changing world. An astounding video research from Sekolah Menengah Sains Hulu Terengganu. To the audience, do us a favor, type out your questions into the live chat. We are sure the presenters are glad to answer them. And of course, an appreciative welcome to our respected judges for making time and effort to lead us throughout the day. <laughs> All right, so firstly, we have um, from user Iman Sa, they are asking, can you elaborate how you conduct your research? A presenters, please can you answer. Thank you for the question. Um, wait, sorry. Thank you for the question. Um, we conduct our research, um, we started off uh, with identifying our research problem. We look for some related literature on the internet to support our research problem. And then once the problem was clearly identified, we came up with our research objective. Based on the research objectives, we developed our research instrument and then most of the question in our questionnaire were adopted from previously existing questionnaire that we found from the related literature. Our interview questions were self-developed and once the questionnaire were ready, we decided to conduct a pilot test to ensure its validity and reliability. There were 30 respondents involved in the pilot test. Uh, and then uh, the pilot test results show the questionnaire is ready to be used for the actual data collection. So we started our data collection process by distributing the questionnaire to our to our respondents through Google Form. We managed to get 80 respondents to respond to our questionnaire and the interview was conducted using WhatsApp with, with four respondents separately. The four respondents were chosen randomly and then we once we had all of our data ready, we proceed with the data analysis. The data from questionnaire were analyzed and summarized in the form of frequency distribution the data from the interview was summarized based on the common themes identified from the responses. And then at the end, we finally proceed with our discussion. And then we also look for more related literature to support our findings. All right, thank you so much for the great explanation. I'm sure the audience are happy with the given answer. Now the next question from user Ain Ayub reads as follows. Why do you choose students as your respondents? Can our presenters please leave a reason? Thank you for the question. So we choose students as our respondents because we can relate as our stu uh, as the students ourselves. We want to uh, we want to know how the pandemic has affected the other students as well. All right, thank you for the explanation, presenter. Okay, since there is no more question from the audience, um, would the judges be kind enough to post a few questions or give a few comments to our presenters? Okay, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, so this is just, uh, okay, what, what kind of digital activities uh, do you do? Uh, to release your stress and keeping you always healthy.
Um, thank you for the question. So uh, I sometimes I use uh, a few of entertainment app to release my stress. Uh, for example, TikTok. <laughs> And then uh, I use Strava too to actually um, help me uh, to do healthy healthy exercises because it, because Strava can uh, we uh, there's a lot of um, things that we can use using the Strava that actually can help us, that can guide me to do exercises. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, you so much for the given answer. Does our judges have any more um, queries for our presenters or maybe some comments they want to share? Uh, I'm just curious uh, why you guys decide not to be appear in your presentation? Hmm. Is there any reason? Thank Why? you for the question. So uh, we had to not appear in the video presentation uh, to to like we don't have to prepare so much for the video presentation be, uh, because we have an exam actually so we might not have enough time to prepare for it so we just have to record the audio and um, search for some medias online all right this concludes the question and answer session for Sekolah Menengah Sains Hulu Terengganu. Thank you to our presenters Nur Amirah and Ainur Alia for addressing the issues brought up by the audience and the judges. We also would like to express our deepest gratitude to our honorable judges for giving the presenters comments and insights that have surely shed new light to all of us. I'm kind of curious about our sub-theme today, Shamim. Would you care to explain it to me and the audience? Of course, I don't mind, Hana. Well, the sub-themes for today's Fully Residential Schools International Symposium are related to the seven sustainable development goals outlined by the United Nations. This track, however, is specifically focused on the ninth SDG, which is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Interesting topic we're discussing today. Let's continue with the next school. All right, so moving on with the next team, let's give a warm welcome to our next presenters, Wan Fadlina binti Wan Muhammad Firman and Kutrinada binti Fakrul Anwar from Sekolah Basrama Penuh Integrasi Kubang Pasu. Let them enlighten us with their video presentation entitled Seeing Realities on the Rise of Augmented, Augmented Reality and Virtual Reality in Malaysia's Real Estate Industry. Please welcome. Hi, my name is Fantabina. Hi, I'm Ai. Hi, my name is Visa Africa. Hi, my name is Putri Nada. Assalamualaikum and hi hi! So first thing first, let's have a look at the introduction, shall we? So, real estate companies have been striking hard across the global supply chain since the COVID-19 outbreak. This pandemic, on the other hand, has expedited the real estate industry digital revolution. In the wake of this huge year for AR and VR, we found these technologies have an exciting potential in the future of real estate industry and how the industry has been utilizing them to the fullest extent. All right, in the next slide, we'll be looking at the background of our research. As Uchihara 2020 stated that, real estate industry experts internationally have raised concern regarding the significant risk posed to the real estate sector by the unprecedented global pandemic of COVID-19. 
Meanwhile, Hopalele 2020 stated that by embracing the digital transformation, real estate professionals can shorten the buying journey and help both buyers and sellers navigate the process more efficiently and easily. The latest innovation in augmented reality, AR, and virtual reality, VR, technology are changing and improving the process of designing, buying, selling, and managing properties more. The research problem of the study is the application of new interactive technologies such as AR and VR are yet to be explored in real estate sector. So similarly, we have come up with four different research questions as per the research objectives as seen on the slide. Let's have a look at the research questions together, shall we? First, what are Malaysians' opinions on the rise of AR and VR in a house purchasing process? Second, what are Malaysians' opinions on the advantages of using AR and VR in a house purchasing process? Third, what are Malaysians' opinions on the disadvantages of using AR and VR in a house purchasing process? Fourth, what are Malaysians' opinions in terms of purchase process experience before COVID-19 versus during COVID-19? Looking at the next slide, we have selected three main keywords for the purpose of the study, which are according to Investopedia, Augmented reality, AR, is an enhanced version of the real physical world that is achieved through the use of digital visual elements, sound, or other sensory stimuli delivered via technology. While Marston Lab stated that virtual reality, AR, is the use of computer technology to create a stimulated environment. And lastly, Coleman stated that PropTech is an innovative approach to real estate in which technology optimizes the way people research, rent, buy, sell, and manage a property. From this research, we emphasize two limitations to be taken into account. First, the opinions of the samples may not adequately represent the opinions of the entire population. Second, this research topic is still new as it only gains recognition during the pandemic and limited people has done the research before. Next, for data collection and analysis process, we collect our data by distributing a form of question air to people around Malaysia and help an interview with a real estate negotiator, Ms. Natasha Gideon. Then, from these two methods, we analyzed the results by using thematic analysis. For the literature review of this research, we have decided to take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of AR and VR in the real estate industry. First thing first, the advantages. In 2016, Gunapati stated that computer-generated reality innovation likewise helps in eliminating expensive undertaking marketing work. On the other hand, Hopulayli in 2020 said, users can virtually view properties from anywhere in the world. Real estate professionals are no longer limited to a local audience. As well as that, in 2019, Yaros said, using virtual reality tours, the user will be able to have a full immersion into 3D environment, investigate every detail, and have a look around all the rooms. Moving on to the disadvantages, in 2021, according to Sharif, the price for virtual tours is determined by utilizing costly devices and involving well-paid experts. Meanwhile, Acharya in 2020 stated that, unlike real-world systems, Virtual reality doesn't offer flexibility in making changes to the preset program sequence. Likewise, in 2020, Jared said, while its application seems far and wide, its technology faces a limitation that cannot be accounted for. So, let's take a look at the result. As we can see at the slide, for this research, we have selected three keywords for the first research question, which is, what are Malaysians' opinion on the rise of AR and VR in the house purchasing process? It was shown that Malaysians think that AR and VR are feasible, helpful, and adaptable, as it fit with current humans' need. So, let's move on to the second research question. We wanted to know what are Malaysians' opinion on the advantages of using AR and VR in the house purchasing process. So, based on our data analysis, we have concluded that Malaysians' opinion on the advantages of using AR and VR in the house purchasing process are comprehensive, time-saving, and wide-ranging. 
One of the samples stated that both of AR and VR reduce the time-consuming process before buying a house. Next, moving on to our third research question. What are Malaysia's opinion on the disadvantages of using AR and VR in the house purchasing process? Based on our analysis, our samples decided that in regarding of the disadvantages, AR and VR limit the imagination of buyers and some buyers might have trouble adapting with the technologies. As sample has stated that, elderly are rejecting the uses of digital technologies in buying set. So moving on to the last research question, what are Malaysia's opinion in terms of purchase experience before COVID-19 versus during COVID-19? We have concluded that there are three main things. There are the abilities for physical contact before COVID-19, changes and adaptation during pandemic crisis, and consequences of COVID-19 on financial influence. As seen here, banks set a stricter procedure during the pandemic. So, let's move to the next part, discussion of our research. AR and VR are playing an increasing role in the real estate market, which is consistent with our current social distancing norms by allowing clients to explore in depth the inside of a house remotely, according to the, our initial research questions that we asked about the industry. Besides, there are some key benefits which save time by eliminating the need to physically move around throughout the property buying process. This is supported by Kevin 2016. It is possible to get a better look at the products from home with AR and VR. The advantages of virtual reality have been discussed so far, but there are also some drawbacks as well. As mentioned by Oli 2021, more than VR implementation do not cover all the human senses. The virtual reality experience may consist of artificial visual, oral, sometimes even haptic sensation. But for example, the sensation of equilibrium and kinesthetic remain unaffected, causing conflicting sensory stimuli. As a final note, for the purchasing process and experience, there are three periods of time that we highlighted in this research, which is before, early, and during the pandemic. Initially, physical contact was required for the purchasing process, but then social distancing was implemented to curb COVID-19. This has let people conducting more online activities and processes become digitalized and available online. Now, we are moving to the next part, the conclusion of our research. AR and VR in the real estate sector fulfill the necessary sequences before stepping into the new norms by embracing digital transformation during the pandemic outbreak. However, there are advantages and disadvantages to adapting to a high demand situation, but it will take time. Further research is recommended to address some unanswered questions about AR and VR in real estate industry, such as data vulnerability, to ensure that this technology demonstrates some effective in real estate sector. Thank you so much to Sekolah Berasrama Penuh Integrasi Kubang Pasu for an exceptional video presentation. Hopefully the viewers gain useful information today. To resume with our event, let us have the audience to ask a few questions in the chat box. I would also love to invite our judges back to the studio with us. All right, so firstly, we have a question from user Siti Ashira Ismail. They are curious about what do you think about this topic why do you think this topic is relevant for this symposium? Our presenters, please help clear the air. All right, let's give a few moments for our presenters to arrange their thoughts. Answer whenever you're ready. Is our presenters clear with the question or should we switch to another one? Sorry, okay. All right. Um, looking at the question, 
why do you think the topic is relevant for this symposium? Because uh, we want to look into how and uh, how AR and VR are increasingly being used, especially uh, during the pandemic. Okay, and we all know that digital revolution is playing an increasingly role in demonstrating uh, positive influence throughout the pandemic. So I think it is good for the uh, symposium to know how the digital revolution uh, is developed in uh, the new attractive technologies such as AR and VR in the real estate. I hope it answers your questions. All right, thank you so much for the given feedback. Okay, we have another interesting question from user Aina Zainal. Um, the question reads as, how does the AR technology revolutionize industries in Malaysia, such as the travel industry or any business? Can our presenters clear the air, please? Okay. Uh, based on the question, thank you. But well, I, think I think this question is uh, un it's it's un uh, irrelevant with our topic right now. So we might move on to next question, please. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay, uh, I have a question. Okay, sorry. All right, so next question is from user soft to okay, v back. Yes. Okay, uh, what is PropTech and how does it work? What is PropTech and how does it work? Okay, what is PropTech and how does it work? Um, for me, uh, a longer word for prop tech is property technology, which means using modern technologies in the real estate uh, industry. So in general, we can say prop tech is the technology for real estate. It's a new approach to process and service management in the real estate sector. I hope that answer your question. All right, thank you so much for the given feedback. Okay, since there is no more questions from the audience, would the judges um, would like to give leave a few remarks for our presenters or ask any questions? Okay, uh, here, well, I have a question. Okay, this actually is actually more into education. Okay, uh, let's say, for example, the Ministry of um, Science and also the Ministry of Education, they have a limited sufficient budget, you know, to develop AR and VR classes. So, which subject do you think that uh, is very useful for the aid of uh, VR and AR? Uh, is it history subject or biology? And why, why, why, why do you choose that? I'm sorry, I cannot hear your question clearly because it's a bit lag on the laptop. Okay, uh, the question is simple. Um, let's say, for example, uh, you you are uh, the, the people develop uh, AR and VR classes. So, uh, which subject do you think uh, is very useful for you? Is it uh, biology or history, and and why why is it is is it important to you? I think, uh, in my opinion, all subjects are uh, suitable with the AR and VR. For example, for biology, we can see the, uh, if we use VR or AR, we can see the biology, uh, like how the system process and uh, what uh, are the organism in the, uh, in the cells. Uh, for Physics, maybe we can see how uh, the process of, uh, let me rephrase it. Um, 
for me it's suitable for uh, all subject as for example history i think um when we use ar or vr we can see the timeline of the uh history so uh it's quite suitable for history too uh for biology uh, we can see the cells in the organism so i think it's quite suitable for all subject in uh, our school education Is this answering All right. your question? Thank you. Thank you so much to our presenters for that great yes. explanation. So um, with that, this wraps up our question and answer session for the team from Sekolah Berasrama Penua Integrasi Kubang Pasu. We would like to thank our presenters Wan Padina and Kutri Nada for answering the audience and judges' curiosity successfully. We also sincerely appreciate the presence of our judges throughout our question and answer session. Well, Hannah, this track subtim is COVID-19, the rise of digital revolution, right? But I'm not sure about the other tracks. So do you mind explaining it to me? Well, the theme for this year is COVID-19 gains and losses. There are six subtemes under it. The first subtheme is COVID-19, a paradigm shift in teaching and learning. Track two is about global economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fourth track subtheme is healthcare innovations and mental health anxiety management during the pandemic. Track five is discussing about climate crisis and change during the pandemic, the promise of a better tomorrow. And track six, the last track, with the last sub theme is social impacts of COVID-19 on a nation's well-being. Wow, that was so interesting. Um, Hannah, it's been two years since the pandemic. How do you feel about virtual learning? Well, it was quite hard to catch up at first, considering the experience being something rather new, I needed time to adapt. Compared to last year, I feel like I'm doing much better in classes and keeping up with schoolwork. I get what you are saying. There was no one to pressure us and we had to rely on ourselves for the most of it. I have definitely learned a thing or two on discipline throughout this whole situation. I feel lucky that I at least have the tools and environment for our online classes, Shamim. I can't help but think about the people struggling with internet connection and devices. It must be really stressful for them. You are right. I hope everyone realizes they are privileged and try to lend a helping hand in this difficult time of crisis. But looks like things are starting to get better, right? Hopefully, we can go to school physically, physically soon enough. Yes, Shamim, I agree with you. Shall we move on with the next school? Yes, all right. So up next, it's our pleasure to invite Wu Mai Chi and Huang Fung Ling from Experimental School of Education and Science, Vietnam, to the studio to continue with their video research on COVID-19 impacts of digital revolution on education in Vietnam. Please welcome. Good morning, my dear teachers and friends. We are a group of four Vietnamese students of the Experimental Secondary School from Vietnam. It's our great pleasure to be here this morning and speak to you about how COVID-19 impacts on the rise of the digital revolution in education in Vietnam. There are three parts in our presentation. In part one, we will cover the status of the digital technology in Vietnam. And in part two, is the rise of the digital revolution in Vietnam's education throughout the pandemic. And in part three, we will illustrate the, of the digital shifts in education with statistics and evidence from our survey conducts and some recommendations of digital adoption to our last pandemic. So now let's start with the current status of the digital technology in Vietnam. The pandemic has changed the way we work and study. In one of its ways for COVID-19 response, Vietnam's government set priority reforms to promote e-learning, e-payments, and e-governance. With a young, uh, 100 million strong population and a consistent GDP growth rate of around 7% over the past 20 years, Vietnam has been rapidly digitizing its infrastructure through national broadband rollout and 4G, 5G deployments as the key to digital transformation and international economic competitiveness. Starting in major urban centers such as Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, affordable 5G will be critical in building smart cities and powering the to increase economic growth. 
generate jobs and grow through mass achieving the clean and sustainable development goal. From 2021, as the step for pushing the fourth industrial revolution, digital transformation rankings will be assessed for Vietnam's industries and province each year, measuring the extent to which national and local authorities have developed online activity in all areas of socialty and economy. Next, my friend Ling Wang will talk about the rise of the digital revolution in Vietnam's education. Education is one of the priority areas for investment national or digital transformation program. In recent years, the education sector has actively applied digital information technology in teaching activities. With a scale of more than 53,000 education and training institutions, 24 million pupils, students, and 1.4 million teachers. The education sector determines that a good implementation of digital transformation will contribute to a successful implementation of the national digital transformation program, contribute to the digital economy, digital society, and the information of the digital nation. With nearly 80% of school students being able to study online and 50% of higher education institutions, Teaching remotely during the period of suspension from school due to the COVID-19 epidemic. Vietnam has been evaluated by domestic and international organizations very positively in the application of online learning forms. It can be seen that the COVID-19 epidemic has created pressure but also ultimately created opportunities and motivation for the education training industry to adapt have the online teaching methods and implement stronger links to a transformation. The application of an online learning management system is capable of managing the process of online teaching learning activities. Digital transformation in education promotes the birth of many new platforms and technologies for e-learning, such as e-books, e-libraries. With the rapid development of technology, social networks, mobile applications today, along with the education industry is promoting the application of digital transformation technology in teaching. All of this has facilitated the digital transformation in education to grow stronger, creating opportunities for everyone to learn and interact at all times and anywhere. To help you understand more about the digital shift in education in Vietnam with statistic number. My team member, my team will explain more. Now, we will illustrate the digital shift in education with statistics and evidence for our survey conducted. Let's start with some ideas of international experts on Vietnam's digital shift in education. Ms. Rana Flowers, Chief Representative of the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF in Vietnam, emphasized the strong solutions provided by MOET are very quick and effective creating great conditions for online teaching and learning in order to maintain student learning activities. Professor Fernando Ramirez of Harvard University also highly appreciated the efforts of the Vietnamese education sector during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to Professor Ramirez, Vietnam has not only demonstrated its commitment to ensuring that all children continue their learning, even when they are not in school, but also triggers initiatives and actions aimed to all students with students from students with full access to students with difficulties to online learning. This survey explores how stakeholders of Hanoi Experimental High School think about COVID-19 impact on digital development in education. Our survey was released to the students, parents, and teachers of the school from 29th August to 15th September 2021, brought in in a total of 776 responses. Most of our respondents is doing more study online, but Microsoft Teams is going to account for a greater portion soon in the near future. With our questions about what benefit can you get from studying online at home? 52% of respondents think that online study saves time paying for traveling so they can utilize that time to do other works. 38% of respondents believe online study can help them to enhance self-study skills, get more active in arranging study time schedule, and develop proactive problem-solving skills. Online studying and online teaching allow students and teachers to digitally interact with each other from anywhere in the world at any time without having to physically travel. It also helps teachers and students optimize learning time 
maximize their ability to think, and most importantly, their study is not interrupted by a pandemic. We have questions about, in your opinion, how has COVID-19 pandemic impact digital technology application in Vietnam's education? 72% of respondents think that the rise of digital revolution driven by COVID-19 has helped develop more digital applications as well as promote teachers and students' IT skills. The ever-increasing presence and influence of technology in education can be seen in many aspects from e-learning, student assessment, customized learning experience to online testing, creating a new era in which teachers and learners are empowered to adopt technology to keep moving forward during COVID-19 pandemic. We also got ideas collected from parents and teachers. 75% of respondents confirmed that digital transformation plays a very important role in teaching curriculum and education during pandemic. Technology can help a teacher at a school in Vietnam take a student on tour across five continents, communicate with foreign friends through multiple lessons across the borders. With a phone or a computer connected to the internet, both teachers and students can access the knowledge base of humanity with just one click. Finally, we would like to share some recommendations on digital adoption to outlast the pandemic. Despite the ongoing health and economic challenges, COVID-19 has also driven the adoption of many digital initiatives. While the future is unpredictable and has more dependence on technology, it is worthwhile to look ahead now to prepare for a changed future. We should prepare ourselves for digital readiness, while prepare for remote work and study arrangements, enhance our digital information and media literacy to catch up with the digital trend, equip ourselves with capable skills in the age of technology, do training, upskilling, and reskilling of the educators, teachers, and students. Business leaders, governments, and educational institutions must work together to upskill our people to drive sustainable economic and educational development for Vietnam. Last but not least, we would like to thank you, teachers, and friends for giving us an opportunity to present today and be able to study and see how the COVID-19 has impacted our normal life and our studying, as well as the rise of digital revolution in education and other aspects. You have made this a big and unforgettable event. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed this presentation. We are so privileged to have ended this session with such an incredible video presentation from Experimental School of Education and Science, Vietnam. Despite the elaborate presentation, I'm pretty sure some of our audience might have some questions lingering in their heads. As usual, if the viewers have any concerns, do voice it out in the chat box. Let us also welcome our judges to administer some guidance for our presenters through commentaries and thought-provoking questions. All right, so firstly, um, we have from user Azurina Noor. They are curious about what is the most meaningful finding in your research? Um, I think the most meaningful finding in our research is the statistics of our survey conducted because it reflects the real experience from our teacher and students when they are adopting and practicing digital technology every single day. And it makes our presentation become more relative. All right, thank you so much for the given answer. I'm sure the audience are happy with the feedback. Following after, a question from user Hasha Mariam. They are curious, in your opinion, do you think online learning is more effective than face-to-face -face learning? Why? Can our presenters provide justification? Um, I think uh, online learning is not more effective than face-to-face -face learning because online learning teacher won't have the ability to to teach more more clearly about the lessons, but we have to figure that out it themselves. But if we study face to face, teacher will be able to uh, teach clearly about the lessons, and we have real life experience too. Uh, we can't do real life experience on online meeting, so I think online learning is not more effective than face to face meeting. A crystal clear explanation. Thank you so much, presenter, for the response. 
Next up, we have a question from user Nur Alia Edina. The, they are asking, what can you say about students who are depressed due to online classes? Can our presenters uh, clear the air? Um, I, I think that the students who are depressed do online classes, but, but we have to deal with it. We have no choice. Well, we want to protect our health by studying online at home. So even though you are depressed, but you have to do it for the society and your own and for your own health and your family. All right. Thank you so much for the response. Is there any more questions from the audience? All right, looks like we have no more questions from the audience. So can we have our judges please leave a few rem remarks or maybe ask questions to our presenters? All right, may I? Uh, before that, good morning. Um, I realized that in your finding, you mentioned that 80% uh, of the students able to access to online um, learning, correct? But my question is, how far the students' acceptance towards online learning during this pandemic? Is my question clear? Is our presenters clear of the question? Do you um, need the judge to rephrase the question, maybe? I think my teammate Ling will answer this question. All right. Can we repeat the questions? Yeah, sure. All right. You mentioned in your finding, uh, your from your survey, 80% of the students able to access to online learning, correct? meaning 80% of the students able to be in online learning. However, my question is how far the acceptance, the, the students' acceptance towards online learning during this pandemic? Presenters? Um, well, I think we have to adopt the digital technology, even though we don't like it, or else our study will be interrupted by the pandemic, and we don't want that to happen. Thank you very much for the given answer. All right. With that, a big round of applause for Wu Mai Chi and Huang Fung Ling from Experimental School of Education and Science Vietnam for the great presentation and for providing explanation for the audience and the judges. Also, not to forget, we also would like to say thank you ever so much to our outstanding judges for the commentaries and interesting questions that for sure has helped enlighten our presenters and the audience. Looks like our session is coming to an end. Fret not, we have two more sessions coming up today. Before we adjourn, we would like to remind the audience that there is an online quiz posted in the chat box at the end of this session. For each quiz set, there will be a total of 20 questions comprising 5 general questions pertaining to the symposium and 15 questions based on the videos in the track. For your information, if you manage to answer 80% of the questions correctly, you will be rewarded with an International Achievement e certificate. The online quiz will be open until tomorrow, Sunday at 10 a.m. Make sure to be on the lookout for the quiz. For a clear understanding, let's watch this short video on what to expect for the quiz. And while we take a short break, we are privileged to have Turkey, Indonesia, Philippines, India, Vietnam, and our beloved country, Malaysia, to keep us entertained with their cultural performance. Thank you to all the viewers. Do stay tuned for our next session that will commence at 10.42 a.m. Let us enjoy the cultural performance. We will be right back.
Some amazing Thai cultures in our school. So let's move on to the first one. Is the Thai boxing, or we call it Muay Thai in Thai language. So in our school, we have physical education lessons that teach us about Muay Thai. The main purpose of the lessons is to teach us how to protect ourselves using Muay Thai moves such as kicking, punching, and elbowing, and to learn some move sets called Wai Kru which are the moves used in a famous ceremony for showing a respect to Thai, to Muay Thai teachers. And this is another picture about the Muay Thai performance in our school. Next, we're going to talk about the Loi Chong Festival in Emwitz. Because in our school, we also have some interesting cultural events in the Loi Chong Festival during November. In this festival, many students in our school would wear traditional Thai clothes, and of course, there would be a lot of cartoons. As you can see in these pictures, the thing that the students are holding is what we call cartoons in Thai. Cartoons are the decorated slices of banana tree trunks with some fashion leaves and candles. In Thai belief, we would later float the cartoon in the body of water in order to thank the goddess of water, which we call Pamekongka in Thai. And furthermore, we also have various range of delicacies and live music played by students and teachers in this festival too. And another cultural performance in Emrit, Kadas or Lam Thai in Thai language, is a combination of get through body movements in Thai traditional music like in Thai Changam, Dong Chan Khuan Fa. Dancers also wear elaborate Thai silk costumes with colorful art and patterns. Pet dance performed by a group of people dancing in a circle pad is called Rambong. Authentic Thai dance is taught for grade 10 students. After the lesson, students will perform it in the Embrit open house, like in the photo. And you can see me in green shirt. This picture from Invit Memory and Invit Media. Thank you. Oh, 
Hello everyone, welcome to our Turkish culture presentation today. And as you can guess from our title, we would like to make you informed about the Turkish culture today. So uh, who are we? Let me introduce myself, I'm Elif Nusorkun, and uh, my other presentation partners are Ibrahim Bayhan, Özgür Özan Güral, uh, Emir Emiroğlu, Merve Dilsizoğlu, and Zeynep Erdoğan. Also, we have two esteemed teachers who are called Ayşe Şule Kılınç and Özner Özcü. So, as we said, today we are going to make you informed about our Turkish culture more by giving some uh, details, stories and myths. So, let's get started. Hello everyone, I'm Ibrahim Bayhan and I'll firstly introduce our uh, school before uh, giving information about our country's culture so um, i'm going to talk about our school and its atmosphere a bit firstly Beşiktaş Sakıp Sabancı Anatolian High School is an international IB school which is located in Beşiktaş in Istanbul we feel lucky for this because Beşiktaş is one of the best neighborhoods in Istanbul. Furthermore, our school has our school's education is for five years because we have English preparation classes as well, and all of us are ninth graders here. What is more, we have so many different clubs in our school, and we believe they are really important for school atmosphere. Hello everyone, I am Merve. Um, you can see the Turkish national anthem. It's İstiklal Marşı, which means Independence March. It was written by Mehmet Akif Ersoy, and I would like to quote something from our anthem. Who would not sacrifice their life for this paradise of a country? 
We see that it represents the difficulties, the efforts and loyalty during the Turkish War of Independence. Even just by reading, we feel like we were there because it is deeply touching. Here is the map of Turkey. As you can see, we have a lot of regions and everything changed city to city. For example, climate, food, traditions, the way of people think. The person you see in the picture is Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Turkish Republic. We owe him a lot because of him, we gained our independence. And Atatürk means a lot to the Turkish people. He led our people during the war. If he hadn't tried so, so hard, we wouldn't have gotten our freedom. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Özgür Özan, and I, I would like to give some um, information about Maiden's Tower. Well, Maiden's Tower has an ancient history. According to the studies, Maiden's Tower was made by Alcibiades in order to control the ships and in order to defend the area against enemies. Maiden's Tower has rebuilt a lot throughout the history, and Maiden's Tower is really famous at the moment. It is still visited by many people today. Hello, I'm Zeyna Pardon, and I'm going to tell you the romantic story of Galata Tower, which is located in the Beyoğlu district of Istanbul. According to the myth, Galata Tower and Maiden's Tower are in love with each other, but the Bosphorus between them prevents lovers from meeting. Galata Tower writes its love in letters for years. When the Turkish scholar Hedarkan Ahmet Çelebi, who was the first to fly in the world, went there to realize his dream of flying, the Galata Tower whispers its love for the Maiden's Tower in his ear and gives the letters to him. His Arafan delivers the letters to the Maiden's Tower, realizing that its love is not platonic. Maiden's Tower leaps for joy. These two lovers' deep feelings for each other help them to challenge the centuries and create the most beautiful view of Istanbul. So, let's talk about some food, shall we? Sultan's Delight. What's the story behind this Turkish well-known food? In 1867, the third Napoleon and his wife, Empress Eugene, were hosting the Ottoman Emperor Sultan Abdulaziz, whom they invited for an international exhibition in Paris. It was here that Sultan Abdulaziz first met Eugene. Two years after this encounter, Abdulaziz still could not forget Eugene, and Eugene could not forget him. The Empress Eugene was also invited to the opening of the Suez Canal that year. On her way to Egypt by ship, she stopped by Abdulaziz in Constantinople. History says that Eugene and Sultan Abdulaziz spent that night together alone. The two lovers had met in Constantinople at the end of two year adventure. However, the story did not have a happy ending. The faces of the lovers did not smile again. Abdulaziz was deposed and killed. Napoleon III was ex exiled with his wife, Eugene. The love story did not end there, and the recipe is left for us in memory. We are talking about Sultan's life. Yes, the Sultan in this meal is Sultan Abdulaziz himself. Rumor, rumor is that when Empress Eugene came to Istanbul, she brought her cook with her. While her cook was preparing bechamel sauce in the kitchen, he caught the attention of the Ottoman cook, and the Ottoman cook did an experiment by adding roasted eggplant to the bechamel sauce. He added the meat that the emperor loved throughout history and present, presented it to the sultan. Since the sultan loved the food very much, the name of the dish became Sultan's Life. And I'm going to present you Turkish cuisine's uh, one of stars, Hosh Merim. And uh, I'm going to talk about the story behind this delight. And according to the rumor, the man of the house who goes to the military returns home with peace and joy after doing his military service for many years. Mrs. Fadime is very happy to see her life partner, whom she loves more than her life, in front of her. She decides to set a table for her valiant but there is no food ready to serve at home. While thinking about what to do, she catches his 
her eye on the fresh cheese hanging in the strainer, Mrs. Fadime decides to prepare something from cheese. She starts to cook the fresh cheese on a low flame. She cooks it by adding egg yolk, sugar, and semolina flour. Mrs. Fadime looks at the pot. It smells good, and the bowl looks good too. She is happy with what she has done. Will the valiant like the meal? She presents her meal to her valiant, and after waiting for him to eat a little, she says curiously, "Hosh mo edim," which means in English, "Is it good, my valiant?" She asks, and her husband appreciates Mrs. Fadime by saying, "Hosh, hosh," in English, "Good, good." Happily, this famous dessert of Balikesir is called Hosh Merim when it is told from mouth to mouth, from ear to ear. Um, after this narration, uh, we would like to end our presentation for today. And thanks for listening and thanks for your attention. And here you can see our names again. Also, if you would like to learn more about us and our school, you can check the Instagram and the name uh, is written here. Again, thank you for listening and see you in the symposium. Bye.
such breathtaking performances and informative presentations from all seven countries. Let us give a round of applause to appreciate such beautiful cultures. Now, let us proceed with our second session. Assalamualaikum and good morning. I wish to the honorable judges, teachers, guests, participants, and all watching today. You are now watching the live streaming of the Night Online Fully Residential Schools International Symposium 2021. Welcome back to our audience before and greetings to our new viewers. We are so delighted to continue with our second session. So, Hana, how are you feeling? I'm eager to continue today's symposium. The videos prepared by the previous schools are all wonderfully made and I'm attaining a lot of new information. I feel the same way. I'm looking forward to the next team's video presentation. I'm pretty sure the audience are too. I heard that everyone today, regardless of whether they are a part of the school's team or not, can acquire an international e-certificate of involvement. Shamim, would you care to explain? Well, actually, for your information, there is an online quiz link pinned in the chat box. We have different sets of questions for our online quizzes according to the tracks. If you manage to answer 80% of the questions correctly, you will be rewarded with an International Achievement e-certificate. Make sure to be on the lookout for the quiz. I hope the audience do not let themselves miss this opportunity. Shamim, I'm kind of curious, who held the first verses? Um, just to let the audience know, the first ever thesis was hosted by Skola Tun Fatima in 2011 with the, team, with the team students, a catalyst of change for a better tomorrow. Ever since its first inception in 2011, it has been held for a total of eight times, making this year's thesis being the ninth one held, and this is the first time it's held online. To add That's on that, the the previous thesis was hosted by Sekolah Batsrama Peno Integrasi Gomba in 2019. The team was smart industry, reforming the world. During the closing ceremony, the Putri Kencana Dance Group from Sekolah Sri Putri gracefully performed, indicating that Sekolah Sri Putri were to be the next host school for thesis. Shamim, I'm so happy that our school, Sekolah Sri Putri, is the host school for this year. How do you feel? Shamim? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Hannah, what were you saying? It's okay, internet connections delay our speeches all the time. I was asking, how do you feel about our school being the whole school this year? Right, I'm pretty sure Shamim is also happy um, that we are all gathered together and we are the moderators and whole school for this year's symposium. So um, fitting with our, um, this is our second time as um, the whole school, but I've never thought about live streaming a symposium before. Technology has really brought us together. It's fitting with our theme, the rise of digital revolution. So without further ado, let us invite the present. Um, the judges over as well, right? According to today's... All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the presentation, I would like to firstly reintroduce you to our esteemed judges. The Chief Judge is Mr. Nick Zahir bin Nick Mama Idris, the Vice President too from Society of Vibration and Acoustic Malaysia. Hello, all. The second judge is Ms. Nurul Fazlina binti Abdul Zaman from Sekolah Menengah Tutan Abdul Halim. And the third and final judge is Ms. Amaria Lopez from Sekolah Menengah Sains Sabah. We would like to welcome all judges to our live streaming today. I am Han Atika binti Zuhazami and my co-moderator just now is Syamim Harun and we are both from Sekolah Seri Putri Sarbijaya. So without further ado, let me remind you of the rules. Number one, the presentation must focus on the sub theme assigned to each team. In this track, the sub theme is COVID 19, the rise of digital revolution. Number two, the duration of the video presentation should not be more than 10 minutes. And number three, a question and answer session will be conducted after each presentation for five minutes. 
All right, to start us off, let us have Akila Aisha binti Muhammad Shahar and Afan Naji bin Rusli from Sekolah Menengah Sains Raja Tun Azlan Shah to proceed with their video presentations entitled COVID-19, a pandem COVID-19 pandemic, a quantum leap in digital entertainment. Please welcome. Hello and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is the Seratas FRSIS team. Introducing our teacher advisor, Madam Nurul Shaida and our team members, Afira, Akila, Faisal and Afan. Our study discusses the rapid adaptation of digital entertainment in society during the pandemic, especially during the enforcement of the movement control order today in Malaysia. We will also describe how social status has led to a gap between those who use digital entertainment to a limited extent or with limited skills. Digital entertainment is a type of entertainment experience thanks to electronic devices such as computers, smartphones or gaming devices. So digital entertainment for me is a type of entertainment where you can experience everything and thanks to the uh, the technology of electronic devices such as computer technology and then you have smartphone mobile phone technology you can you can see that we also we cannot for, uh, forget about the entertainment and networking technology since the enforcement of movement control order 2.0 has been implemented again during this year of march 2021 this has alarmed many Malaysians. Movement restriction has resulted in more exposure towards digital media, especially digital entertainment, to cope with the pressure of the pandemic. However, when we talk about digital, it's very close to entertainment because it's always attract and engage people in, uh, in any situation when you use digital platform. For this study, we chose to implement both quantitative and qualitative methods to help with our research. We gathered 426 respondents that were divided into four age groups for an online survey. Another form of the quantitative method we used for this research study was getting information from two professionals through a virtual interview. As a researcher and associate professor from prestigious universities in Malaysia, Professor Dr. Siti Hafiza Abdul Hamid from the University of Malaya and Professor Dr. Maizatul Hayati Muhammad Yatim from University Pendidikan Sultan Idris with a set of questions that correlated and helped with our research study. As for the qualitative research method, the internet, mainly informational websites, assisted us in finding essential information that could help us come to a conclusion for the study. Multiple articles from Google Scholar were used as references to reinforce the data we found through the quantitative approach and aided in bringing our study to a sturdy conclusion. The data found from these research methods were then analyzed and classified into graphs for a visual representation of the ever-increasing demand for the digital entertainment industry during the COVID-19 pandemic. To date, the enforcement of Movement Control Order 2.0 since March this year due to increasing spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has alarmed many people. However, in response to dealing with a pandemic affecting everyone's health as a whole, World Health Organization WHO has advised all affected countries, including Malaysia, to implement lockdown or movement restrictions. In our case, our government decided it was better to enforce movement restrictions for economic purposes. However, this movement restriction has taken a toll to every situation. It is no denying that this restriction has pressured everyone while affecting many aspects of life. So, it's not surprising at all to see that digital entertainment has become viral over the course of this pandemic to cope with the pressure. There are many examples of the rising of digital entertainment we can see today. If you know about virtual museum, now we cannot go to any museum, definitely. 
is not a uh, you know necess- uh, it's not necessity you know so but then for museum people they have to survive so the only thing that they can survive is to have virtual museum so for those who love art love you know go to museum they have another option during pandemic they have virtual uh, museum so when you talk about virtual museum so again it's about digital entertainment during the movement restriction order the need for human interaction fuels people to have some medium to connect the availability of mediums such as zoom or google meet provides a way for people to communicate these platforms offer a chance for others for communicating social media has become a boom during movement restriction order people use those platforms like twitter or facebook to know what happened in our community it is like social media are becoming the digital discussion platform for everyone people spend less time with digital entertainment before the pandemic as they were still interacting with others witnessing some issues to be handled on the spot video streaming services such as netflix or youtube has also been popular over the course of this movement restriction order people cannot go out on their leisure the best thing we could do is to entertain ourselves by watching lots of videos though some may prefer to play games There are few industries affected by this pandemic, namely tourism industry or small business industry. In order to survive through the lack of society's attention, they resort to digital platforms like virtual museums, virtual zoo tour, virtual concert. These are all done in order for these industries to survive. Referring to our survey findings, we found that most B40s had limited access to digital entertainment. However, during the pandemic, digital technology companies make their products cheaper to be accessible during these trying times. We can see telecommunications services had started to offer much cheaper data plans, especially made for the B40s, to give a chance for them to rejoice in this digital advancement. Most respondents from our survey collectively suggested that there should be more funding for data coverage in rural areas. Thus, the budget for entertainment in 2021 of 6 million Malaysia ringgit was ideally enough for stations in rural areas to provide accessibility for an internet connection. As we have pressed on throughout this investigation, one of the few industries that went through significant advancement was the digital technology industry. Digital entertainment has developed into a coping mechanism in response to the virus tolling in our life. Due to the rising demand for digital technology and a much cheaper data plan, the accessibility of digital technology for the use of entertainment during the pandemic was shown to be increasing. According to our findings from the survey we conducted, on average before the COVID-19 pandemic, people have used digital technology for multiple purposes, for minimum 3 hours to more than 8 hours. The next graph represents the hours spent by people on average for entertainment purpose only during the pandemic. We can see the significant change in the usage of digital entertainment by society. Our presentation proves that this COVID-19 pandemic, though terrible news, has become a stepping stone for certain things, especially digital entertainment. Society was mainly able to adapt to the immediate shifts in consumer behavior. We can see a clear correlation between changes in user activity before and during the pandemic. Addressing our concern of whether the social status difference has reduced the accessibility to digital entertainment is also proven when our findings suggest that society agrees there are gaps between users with privileges and the users with limited skills or users who use digital technology for a limited purpose. Then we had also managed to suggest few solutions to overcome the gaps. present today between experts users of digital entertainment and those with limited knowledge of digital entertainment due to social status 
this leap of progression proves to be a chance for us to excel in improving digital technology for entertainment purposes. It also happens to open up a new era of an industrial revolution that could be proved as advantageous to us all. Thus, we concluded that it has indeed benefited all of us. The quantum leap of digital entertainment during pandemic is a gain for us. That's all from Team of Seratas. Thank you. What a brilliant video presentation by Sekolah Menengah Sains Raja Tun Azlan Shah. However, the audience must have a lot of questions for the presenters. Do not let your curious minds stay silent and please leave your questions in the chat box. I would also love to invite our judges back to the studio with us. All right, so firstly, we have an intriguing question from user Nurul Nalia Nawi. The, their inquiry reads as, who are the subjects or respondents in your research? Can our presenters kindly answer? Uh, hello and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all of the judges and uh, moderators. Uh, okay, so the question was, who are the subjects or respondents? In our research. So, as uh, you can tell, that we have 400 over which were divided into age group, which were teenagers, adrastic, uh, young age group, and middle age group. And we also conducted uh, an interview with uh, two professionals from University Malaya, which is Dr. Siti Hafiza, and uh, from E, uh, University. Uh, which is Dr. Maizatul Hayati. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's all. Alright, thank you so much for the explanation. The next question is from user Siti Ashira Ismail. Um, about do you think social influences should be taxed for their income gotten from their online business? Shall we have the presenters to address the issue? Um, hello? Yes. Um, so do I think social influences should be taxed? Um, I think they really, um, because, uh, since the pandemic is, uh, widely restricts us to, uh, on to business, business face to face, then I think I don't think they should be taxed for uh, an online business because it is uh, the the one form of uh, income. Thank you. All right. Thank you, presenter, for the great clarification. Do we have any more questions? All right, the next question is from user Nurul Hanis. They are asking, do you think it is important to spread awareness about this issue and why? Our presenters, please help to the end. All right, so the question is, do you think it is important to spread awareness about this issue and why? I think, yes. Uh, digital entertainment uh, correlates with digital technology and it is very important for this because uh, after the start of this pandemic, we see more rise of digital revolution. So, uh, so it is important to know how long uh, a teenager use digital technology for what? For digital, uh, digital learning or social media. So we need to know uh, what, uh, what, what are the things that the teenagers do, and we need more studies uh, conduct to be conducted about this issue, which is the uh, quantum leap in digital entertainment. Such a crystal clear explanation. Thank you very much for the response. Okay, seems like um, there's no more questions from the, from the audience. So shall we have any of the judges to post a few questions or leave any remarks for our presenters? 
Uh, yes, I have. May I? All right. Um, you are involving a quite big number of respondents, correct? 400 something. So I'm curious, um, how many items in your questionnaire or survey and what method that you use to analyze the result? Because it's quite big number, correct? And then how long do you analyze it? Uh, so, um, uh, uh, okay, okay, I'll find go on. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll leave Akila to, um, uh, to add something uh, later on. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, okay. So, the uh, the survey was conducted 400, uh, 400 over. Okay, so uh, we divided into the age groups. And then the question items, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there were 30. 20 to 30 questions and uh, they were all asking about uh, the what are the maybe the the things or the ways that we can do to overcome this uh, digital uh, the problems with the digital uh, technologies and entertainment so uh, how long for <laughs> for us to analyze is that we took at least I think maybe two weeks because, as you said, there is a lot uh, of the uh, data that we have to uh, to analyze and everything. So it took two to three weeks. Yes. Is there any software that you use to analyze oh. your uh, so yeah your finding? When the softwares, uh, we use uh, the Microsoft Excel. So uh, as we use Google Form, so we have the spreadsheet. So we have the spreadsheet, so uh, we do it in the list. So we took one by one on uh, all the uh, the respondents' uh, response. Uh, so yeah, so we put it in another uh, doc. So we have the re report of everything. Uh. All right, thank you so much. Um, but we would love to continue with such an exciting question and answer session, but unfortunately, time is up. Thank you so much to Sekolah Menengah Sains Raja Tun Azlan Shah and the presenters Akila Aisyah binti Muhammad Shahar and Afan Najib binti Rusdi for answering the audience's curiosities. And not to forget, our deepest gratitude towards the judges for helping us out for the question and answer session. Hannah, I think I don't understand a lot about our sub team today. Can you explain a little bit about it to me and our audience? The strike sub team is COVID-19, the rise of digital revolution. With the sudden rise of the COVID-19 pandemic, manufacturing industries were hit hard and caused disruptions in global value chains and the supply of products. Having industries everywhere forced the shift to the virtual world, innovation and technological progress are key to finding lasting solutions both economic and environmental environmental challenges, such as increased resource and energy efficiency. I'm glad we are discussing such topics. So shall we invite the next team? Well, they seem to not be here yet. So while we still have time, Shamim, um, I've heard you got the first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. So did you have any side effects after getting your shot? Well, I'm sure that no two bodies react the same way to the same vaccine, right? So, Alhamdulillah, I'm all good after getting my first first dose of vaccine. How about you, Hana? After I got my first dose, my side effects were not that bad, but I had a slight fever and muscle pains everywhere. If I think about it again, I feel quite satisfied knowing that my body defense system is um, trying its best to protect my body against such diseases. Yes, you are right, Hannah. I agree with you. The COVID vaccine surely gives us a lot of positive impacts. I really, I really hope that everyone that refuses to get the vaccine will change their mind, though. I hope so, too. If all of us get vaccinated, we can finally live as how we used to be. I really miss going out without wearing a mask. Um, shall we invite our next school? Yeah, sure. Moving on with the event, we have Mama Adli Arif bin Azhari and Siti Amira Husna binti Mama Nur Azam representing Sekolah Menengah Sains Kuala Selangor here today. Let's enjoy their well-prepared video presentation and technology key to every life aspect, true or false. Please welcome. <laughs> As the world it is right now, 
Bertage is inevitable to the spread of contagious pandemic. Technology plays a crucial role in helping humans to survive and adapt to the new norms. Still, does technology only bring fortunes to humans, or does it actually attract to humans' development? So this is where our topic of symposium is relevant to be brought up. Technology key to every life aspect, true or false. Under the sub-theme of COVID-19, Kalen, rise of digital revolution. What is meant by technology key to every life aspect? Technology is without a doubt a privilege to humans, and Eric Schaas books say, and I quote, technology is one of the keywords of the world, yet this is also the most confused. As technology becomes humans' weapons, or in other words, essence, base of our lives, where everything we do needs to help technology, we fail to realize that technology also leads to our doom. And as the world reach the highest peak of digital revolution, we are bound to bow to technology. John Thompson, in the books of Digital Ages, stated, and I quote, Digital revolution is a profound change in technological processes and industrial structure, meaning that these changes, this development, this technological processes is no longer changeable. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we apologize for the technical glitches, but don't worry, as you can always watch the full video on our FIRSIS website. Just click on the link of each school. However, I'm sure we are all amazed by the excellent video presentation from Sekolah Menengah Sains Kuala Selangor. Such an interesting topic must leave some of you wondering as to how, what, and why. So please do us a favor and insert your questions in the live chat. Let us also have the judges back at the studio to accompany our question and answer session. Okay, so firstly, we have an intriguing question from user Nur Aina Fariha binti Ruslan. They are asking, what is one of the biggest challenge that you had to face while completing the research? Uh, Lee, may I answer the question? Sure. Uh, so, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, what is the biggest, what is one of the biggest challenge that we had to face while completing the research? So, first of all, it is all about time since we're having PDPR from home as well as the extra classes that we're having. So, one of the biggest challenge that we had to comply with is the shortness of time to do the research and then also since we're doing research together we have to discuss when we have to discuss we have to do google meet or either discuss it in the whatsapp group so sometimes some of us couldn't get into the google meet might be because of their internet line as well as they're having extra classes at that time even during the weekend so i think that is some of the biggest challenge that we had to face when completing the research. Thank you so much for the given feedback. I'm sure the, the audience are happy with the given answer. Moving on, there is an inquiry from user Afifa Zulkarnain. They asked, what inspired you to choose this topic in particular? Our presenters, please help clear the air. Okay, I'll be answering this question again. So, what inspired us to choose this topic in particular? So firstly, this is all based on the our daily life situation nowadays. So most of us are bound to our home and we require technologies to communicate with each other. So for students, they're using the technologies to for education purposes, while for some adults, they're using technologies to for work purposes. So there is some issues related to this usage of technologies. Uh, for students, um, the issues from technology is that sometimes they couldn't focus on their schoolwork when there's technology nearby. And uh, for the adults, they have some problems to comply with the technologies since the technologies nowadays are more advanced rather than years before. 
So they have some problems to comply with the technologies nowadays. But rather, but despite these issues, we also know that there's advantages from these technologies. So we wonder uh, if technologies actually have more advantages or more disadvantages. Therefore, from our research, which which we get from going through articles, also going through forums and doing questionnaire, we come to conclude that technology will have more advantages than disadvantages when it is used wisely and vice versa. Perfectly worded. Thank you very much for that brilliant explanation. Do we have any more questions from our audience? All right, since there is no more questions from the audience, now I would like to invite any of the judges who would like to post a few questions or give some positive comments or to our presenters. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I think mostly... Uh, uh, most are aware that uh, you know Kabi, you know Kabi, they use TikTok like this, you know, to show how to simplify to simplify the daily activities. So, does your teacher in your school uses TikTok or for for the teaching aid? If you can share with us. Yeah, so, if I may, I will answer this question. So, I think some teachers did use um, the platform like TikTok and stuff while teaching us. Um, even our teacher, one of my teacher in uh, if I'm not mistaken, what subject is um, Agam Islam. He she asked us to actually create a video through TikTok and explain the stuff and the topic that he, that she have asked and she have actually picked for us to do on. So the answer is yes. Uh, our teacher did use this kind of platform like TikToks in teaching and learning at school. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the given answer. Do we have any more questions from the judges or maybe some comments they want to leave for our presenters? All right, since there's no more any questions, so that concludes our question and answer session for Sekolah Menengah Sains Kuala Selangor. Thank you so much to our presenter, Muhammad Adli Arif and Siti Amira Husna for the great presentation and for addressing the question from the audience and the judges. We also would like to thank the judges for accompanying us throughout this question and answer session. Shamim, do you know how many schools are here with us today? As far as I know, this year's FRISIS has received participation from countries such as India, Thailand, Turkey, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Philippines. This year, a total of 105 international participants have come together in this auspicious event. In addition, the total number of participants is around 470, par 470 students, comprising all 70 fully residential schools nationwide. To name a few, there are participants from Sekolah Tuan Ku Abdul Rahman, Sekolah Menengah Sains Miri, the Malay College, Sekolah Menengah Sains Zili, the Royal Military College, Sekolah Bahasa Mapeno, Integrasi Selanda, and many others. I'm so happy we have so many schools participating in our ninth verses this year. Well, Shamim, it's been two years since the pandemic. How do you feel about virtual learning? It was quite hard to catch up at first, considering the experience being something rather new, I needed time to adapt. Compared to last year, I feel like I'm doing much better in classes and keeping up with school works. I get what you're saying, Shamim. There was no one to pressure us, and we had to rely on ourselves for the most of it. I've definitely learned a thing or two on discipline throughout this whole situation. I feel lucky. I feel like lucky that I at least have the tools for an environment for our online classes. But I can't, I can't help but think about the people struggling with the internet connection and devices. It must be really stressful for them, right? 
You're right, Shamim. I hope everyone realizes their privilege and try to lend a helping hand in these difficult times of crisis. But it looks like things are starting to get better. Hopefully, we can go to school physically soon enough. I hope so too. I'm not sure if our audience will heartedly agree. How is everyone feeling? Does anyone prefer online learning compared to going to school physically? Everyone has their own opinions regarding this matter. There are pros and cons about both physical and online classes. And well, Shami, Hannah, uh, yes, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Continue, Shami, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I'm kind of curious about who held the first free seats. Well, just to let the audience know, uh, the first ever Firsis was hosted by Sekolah Tun Fatimah in 2011, with the students a catalyst of change for a better tomorrow. Ever since its first inception in 2011, it has been held for a total of eight times, making this year's Firsis being the ninth one held, and this is the first time it's held online. So on to that, the previous Firsis was hosted by Sekolah Barasrama Pendung Integrasi Gomba in 2019. The theme was Smart Industry Reforming the World, during the closing ceremony, the Putri Kencana Dance Group from Skola Sri Putri gracefully performed, indicating that Skola Sri Putri were to be the next host school for Firsis. By the way, Shamim, I'm so happy that our school, Skola Sri Putri, is the host school this year. How do you feel? Well, I feel happy too, Hana. This is our second time as the host school, but I've never thought about live streaming a symposium before. Right, Shamim, technology has really brought us together. Fitting with our team, Hana, the rise of digital revolution, can you explain to me a bit regarding the sub theme? Well, with the sudden rise of the COVID-19 pandemic, if there were any lingering doubts about the necessity of digital transformation to business longevity, the coronavirus has silenced them. In a contactless world, the vast majority of interactions with customers and employees must take place virtually. With rare exception, Operating digitally is the only way to stay in business through mandated shutdowns and restricted activity. But that is from the perspective of business. I'm pretty sure there are a lot more um, aspects that has benefited from the rise of digital revolution. Seems like this is just the beginning to Hana. The pandemic is a reality check for business that businesses that have been reluctant to embrace digital transformation and now find themselves woefully unprepared. To be listening to presentations that discuss these issues, Shamim, I believe I'm very lucky to be here today. I feel the same way. All right, Shamim, do you have any more, um, any perhaps app recommendations to assist me with online learning? Because I've been meaning to make notes on my iPad. Well, I actually discovered quite a lot of application, but to recommend you some, uh, you can use um, this application called Good Notes to create beautiful notes as it has a lot of features, but you have to pay for it though. But it's worth the money. Yes, like you can make notes in the class while listening to the teachers. Well, other than that, I would like to recommend this note this application called Cola Notes. The features are similar to Notability and Good Notes, and it's free. So I think it's very good for students like us since we don't have a lot of money to buy application on app stores, right? But I feel that um, paying for applications is sometimes worth it, if considering the features that it has, of course. Because you know when you want to use um, these apps that has to pay, but it's very high quality, I think that um, I wouldn't mind spending a bit of cash for those sort of apps, right, Shamin? Yes, I agree with you. But other than that, I would like to, I think this app, everyone knows about it. Um, this app is called Canva. Um, just like how our school is currently using it quite a lot in like, in our co-curriculum activities, club activities like that, we have used this app quite a lot, right? Since the features are so beautiful and the stickers too. Yes, I've used Canva quite a lot as well, but it's quite hard to use on my iPad because um, it seems to be using a lot of RAM. But I think um, overall Canva is a really good app if you're looking 
for something that already has templates for your presentations and such, right? Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I think our teachers has, our teachers are using ClassPoint and Pear Deck for our online classes, right? So how do you feel about that type of I feel application like I really and like website? It. It's very interesting because it's very interactive compared to um, in physical classes where everyone um, just listens, right? But we, um, when we use this sort of apps, we have like something to keep us engaged when we're um, going through our classes. So I find it really interesting. So how about you, Shaman? Do you like it? Well, I think I like it too, since like before this, um, we kind of used to hear our teachers talking about the lesson in the class, right? So while using the class point, I think like my ability to focus on the subject is getting better, you know, like we, we did quite a lot of activities, like we need to write the answer. So with that activity, I feel like I didn't distract it a lot during the class. Yes, I agree with you, Shamim. So what about we invite the next school over? All right. Next up, let us have our next presenters, Hadifa Zahwa binti Abdul Hadi and Amir Arshad bin Azmi from Sekolah Menengah Sains Labuan to present their well-prepared video presentation on businesses going digital to resume today's event. Please welcome. This is the fully residential Rose International Symposium for the year 2021. You are currently opening the file Businesses Goes Digital, presented by Sekolah Menengah Sains Labuan. Assalamualaikum, I say to all. The first thing I'm going to talk about is digital revolution in business. In general, digital revolution are the advancement of technology from analog, electronic, and mechanical device to the digital technology available today. Technologies have enabled us to reduce costs and make everyone's lives better. However, due to the ongoing pandemic, workers in business sectors are so inundated with emails and everything are being digitized which have caused workers to have less time to focus on critical and creative thinking. Therefore, a study must be conducted to meet the optimum way in harnessing the full power of digital technology while measuring the efficiency of data processing, retrieving information, presenting knowledge, and one-to-one -one communication. Now, let's talk about online business. Nowadays, the use of e-commerce for businesses has become important not only for the purpose to preserve their own place on the market, but also to expand market share in connection with the rapid development of information technologies. At the beginning, it is important to state that the internet gives a lot of new opportunities for modern companies to extend their activities and to increase their profits. It has a place because online business is a kind of new economic system which allows to increase sales and to reduce costs. It is a doubtful fact that the development of the internet has created a new kind of economy with so enormous space of growth that it has already changed the very concept of a traditional business. What Amir said is totally true. Now let's look into the perks of online business benefits. Firstly, the efficiency of data management. Secondly, the improvement in client services. Thirdly, the global level business. And fourth, the affordable cost. Seems a lot. Well, I'm sure there's more. Thanks, Hadifa, for the upbringing intro. Let me take it from here. To begin with, technology helps online businesses increase the efficiency of data management. As you can see from the title, the chart explains the percentage of active online shoppers conducting online purchases every two months. We will be focusing at the dark green color that is the changes since the outbreak of COVID-19. Electronic goods has the highest increment at 10%. Health industry and do-it-yourself products has the second highest increment at 9%. From this chart, we can conclude that shoppers are more attracted and interested to shop online than going to the store since the pandemic started. Let's dig into more details. How we get data? Data is actually created by a vast multitude from different sources. We may not know, but data is categorized as structured and unstructured data. Structured data is information that is highly organized, can be uploaded and detected by the algorithm easily. 
For example, numerical information that does not require interpretation. Meanwhile, unstructured data is vice versa from the structured data. It is really messy and hard to be detected. For example, slang languages like LOL and FYI. Basically, anything that are human-generated, usually language-based. How do data pile up? Let me give an understandable example. Imagine you are filling a form to apply a job, and at the same time, 1 million more people are filling the same form as you did. It is a fact that the amount of data increased way more than most companies' ability to process it. This stated fact will lead to this problem. According to a study published by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, 61% of managers reporting that the information overload at their workplace. The next point is technology revolution also allows private businesses or public organizations to quickly and easily access at any product data at any time. It is really helpful for product management. In the business world, catalog is one of the marketing strategies to gain profits. Well, catalog stores huge amount of data, so with the help of technology revolution, it will give the advantage to classifying the data and achieve any business's goal that one's company has targeted. The better the management of catalog, the better opportunity to ad advertise and sell the products or services. Data management systems provide the key to utilizing data in various forms. Strategic technologies can help private businesses or public organizations to improve organizational consistency, increase productivity, create greater collaboration or communication, and foster more knowledgeable business decisions so much about online businesses and data management, don't you? Now, let's move on with how online businesses improve client services. Surely, every online consumer would prefer a more friendly and approachable seller, wouldn't they? Customer services experience are just as crucial as the product itself to ensure customers feel satisfactory, especially feedbacks they get may affect future sales. Although online businesses lack face-to-face -face contact, it has its own way to improve customer service. Here are a few ways online businesses owners can ensure client services are always over the top. Firstly, follow-ups. Seller can identify problems that occur from complaints quickly due to easy communication through online chats. This can prevent clients from giving negative feedbacks. Next is availability. Having online businesses means time is more flexible, where seller can provide services 24-7. This proves the convenience of online businesses when orders are available from every corner of the world, thanks to the internet. To show statistics from a resource and some samples from a quick survey that we prepared proves that people are more fond Let me tell you why. Online businesses are most likely to make maximum profit, whereas offline shops may lack availability because they have limited time for sale. Other than that, good client services by online businessmen may lead to loyal customers which may promote their businesses to other communities. Thus, helping your businesses to spend less on marketing like promotion ads. It's a good point, Hasha. Now, let's talk about how online business can go next level. I mean, globally. Oh, wait. Did you know coronavirus has caused an increase of e-commerce by almost 20% in the US over the year? It is most likely to still grow even after the pandemic settles. First things first, we must know the main component of an online business, which is how do we manage our business online. Since many stores and factories are shut down, People often use social media platforms to manage their business. A few examples of the social media platforms are Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and many more. But 
the real question is how do we attract global consumers there is a lot of ways on how you can reach global audience one of the best way is to overcome the language barrier for example you can make an advertisement with various languages however being a global brand means dealing with more than a few countries with different cultures it means being able to market your products to nearly every country with an open market it is safe to say that the usage of social media platform online is a must to reach consumers from all over the globe this will certainly make online businesses increasingly popular and have greater opportunity to go worldwide since not everyone in this world understands english overcoming the communication barrier in your business will make people from around the world understand what your business is about this will definitely develop interest among the people from other countries overcoming the communication barrier will also give your business a high potential to become a global business yeah but let's not forget how online business consists of lower operating costs okay now the main point is e-commerce can reduce labor and is affordable for operating costs so how does e-commerce have an affordable amount of employees e-business covers the costs in many areas such as mail preparation telephone calls data entry overtime and supervision expenses thereby reducing the cost of individual transactions the use of electronic digital marketing has saved up tremendous expenses over traditional methods thus reduced the number of employees great for small businesses so how is it considered free and efficient in online marketing it is free because of the availability of free platforms across the internet set up stores and stop selling products immediately making it easy for sellers free of charge as the e-commerce interest will grow customers prefer faster deliveries a broader product range and better product qualities it is revealed that online marketing is effective in the integrated marketing communication strategy of the organization by increasing brand awareness improve customer satisfaction easy integration and management and facilitates automation of marketing activities thus making it efficient for both parties why is online marketing better than traditional marketing What is the difference? Well, you see, online and offline marketing are different in many ways. For instance, while traditional marketing requires numerous human resources, online marketing can be done and managed by a single person. The first problem that will ever come up to businessmen is about their finances. It is an unavoidable problem for them. That is until they came up with online marketing. Contrast to traditional marketing, online marketing costs less, but still create a massive impact. Thus, show that online marketing is better than offline. Phew, that was precise. Ultimately, it is undeniable that technology gives a big hand when it comes to businesses, especially during this COVID-19 outbreak. Technologies would have never been bad for our lives if we use it for a greater purpose. Unfortunately, we have come to an end. We've only cleared up just a few pieces of the actual business field. But we hope you may gain even a few knowledge about digital revolution in the business industry in the span of 10 minutes. Online businesses must not always be all trends and rainbows. There will be a few rough days, but I assure you, you will get there one day. Put in effort and let success be on your side. And dear internet servers, use internet for good. You may benefit from it, you know. An incredible video presentation from Sekolah Menengah Sains Labuan. Interesting topic must leave have must have ignited some thoughts for our audience. As usual, if the viewers have any questions or concerns, do voice it out in the chat box. Let us also have the judges back at the studio to accompany our question and answer session.
Okay, firstly, we have an intriguing question from user Nurul Nalia Nawi. They're asking, what are the issues in technology that you can highlight based on your research? Can our presenters kindly answer? Let's give a few moments to our presenters to clear their thoughts and arrange what they have to say. Answer whenever you're ready, presenter. Are our presenters clear of the question? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank the panel of judges and the host of this program. Uh, now back into the question. Uh, so our highlight in this project is to is about the online business that grows uh, quickly on charts these days. Uh, and our main point here is about the increase of the efficiency of data management, the greater flexibility in client services the opportunities to manage your our business from anywhere in the world and as well as the lower operating costs. Thank you very much for the answer. I'm sure the viewers are happy with the given answer. Okay, our next question is from user Siti Ashira Ismail. Um, they are asking, do you think small and mid-sized enterprises need funding from government to survive during this pandemic? Can our presenters help clear the air? Is our presenters clear of the question? Yes, the SMEs need funding from government to survive during this pandemic. This is because um, small business need money from the government to actually improve the to, to improve their business. Perfectly worded. Thank you very much, presenter, for the explanation. So moving on, um, shall we have the judges to pose a few questions or maybe leave some remarks for our presenters today? Can I ask questions? There are no questions from audience, is it? Yes, sure. Um, go ahead and ask your question, please. Okay. So you are students. You have actually uh, doing research, did a research on business online. So what further research would you like to have conducted and why? Did you get me? Um, excuse me, can you repeat the question? Okay, you guys as students have actually conducted a research on business online. So what further research would you like to have conducted and why? Further research. Uh, thank you for the question. So for if we have if we can conduct a further research, um, I think we might actually conduct a business about online business post pandemic. And the reason why is because uh, businesses have been in decline and to see the difference between the first time it was an on, the first time it became an online business, uh, when it the when the pandemic started and after the post pandemic. Okay, cool. 
Alright, thank you very much for the given answer. So, unfortunately, time is up because we need to make room for the next presentation. Thank you so much for our presenters, Hadi Fazawa and Amir Arshad from Sekolah Menengah Sains Labuan for answering the audience and the judges' curiosity successfully. We also sincerely appreciate the presence of our judges throughout this question and answer session. I'm still curious about our sub theme today, Shamim. Would you, would you care to explain further? Of course, I don't mind, Hana. The sub theme for today's fully residential schools international symposium are related to the 17 sustainable development goals outlined by the United Nations. This track, however, is specifically focused on the ninth SDG, which is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Shamim, we've heard about um, a presentation regarding um, businesses, how they're doing during this pandemic, right? So yeah. what do you think of online shopping? Well, I think online shopping is quite good um, compared to physical shopping since there are a lot of pros and cons. But I think online shopping is time less time needed to buy something since we don't have to walk into the physical stores. Like, you know, we, we need to walk into the mall in the malls right so basically yeah. if you use online shopping it's like you just have to click on the button and then wow you have you have buy something easier right yes i get your How point about you, Shami, it's very time efficient and it requires less effort but for me i love physical shopping because i like the experience of walking into a shop and choosing what i want to buy when i'm there right and i feel like I make better decisions when I'm in the store um, compared to when I'm like behind my phone and I have all these choices that I can just click on and waste my money on. Yes, I so, agree Shami, with you. Um, when you do online shopping, right? Uh, what do you tend to buy? Well, I think I like to search for new clothes since like, even though we are not allowed to go out due to MCO, but I think I like to do to search for many beautiful clothes like the trend now. I usually search for knitted outerwear like that. Yeah. How about you, Hannah? Yes, it's trending right now, right? So um, I think for me, online shopping has just begun, and it will continue to become more and more um, efficient and more easy, um, user friendly for everyone. So I'm looking yeah. forward to that um, progress. So let's continue with the next school. Sure. Our last team for the session, let's give it up for Vo Tandan and Tong Duk Tutam from IGC Tai Bin Dong Primary Middle High School to the studio to continue with their video research on digitizing hospital data for inclusive patient support in Vietnam. Please welcome. Hello, everyone. Our group research title is in hospital data for inclusive patient support in Vietnam. Good. We will go through six parts, which are introduction, statement of problem and theory, methodology, results and discussion, and then conclusion. Finally, our recommendation. People have begun to adapt and accept technology as it has progressed from the most basic form to its most advanced forms, as well as also seeing it as a type of treasure that requires cramming as much knowledge as possible to maximize the value of human life while also limiting the work we need to do. The result from Critia 2020 is that by using technology, the medical field could make discoveries uh, regarding treatment, data collection, disease research, field research, human acting devices sites now the electronic documents and the internet provides the foundation for longitude medical records that can be shared among every site along with that it can remember a patient medical field without having a book like the old days still there's a problem you still need to transfer your old health record to this new hospital due to a lack of information about you. This is a waste of time and money. Over the last decade, 
healthcare records are primarily stored on paper and offline in storage. When time flows, data multiply and offline storage becomes useless for big data. As a result, online storage were innovative and effective to the community of MIOT, Medical Internet of Things. It helped business change the world process, productivity prices, and customer experiments. Doctors can check the patient data at every hospital with a health tablet. This new method can save time for both patient and doctor regarding the health check. However, this technique has some challenges too. The four Vs of big data analytics in healthcare are also important, and they are volume, velocity, variety, and diversity, as Rock Party and Rock Party 2014 mentioned. We have three statements of the problem. First one is, what is the current status of gathering data among patients during the COVID-19 pandemic? Secondly, what is the importance of data management during the COVID-19 pandemic? And lastly, what are the challenges faced by the doctor and patient when it comes to access to health? Now on to the theories, we have three current theories. Number one being the actor network theory, the second one being the medicalization theory from Harvard in 2008, and the last one being the theory of network power. Moving on to our research methodology. So far to gather information enhance our project's probability of success, we, the researchers, decided to use a mixed method to collect both quantitative and qualitative data. A total of 37 billboards has gone to the medical problems or check up answer the survey all of whom were around the age of 25 to 40. The study made use of descriptive statistics to analyze the data, as well as interpret the interviews by coming up with themes and codes. Mm. And now for our result and discussion. Table 1.1 present the frequency of the medical checkup at the hospital, where rarely and occasionally has a result of 45.9% respectively. Number 1.2 evaluates the difficulties in receiving health care where 56.8% answer normal. Number 1.3 because it's the format of document needed to hand in the for hospital it visits and it's so 81.1% is still using paper. Number 1.4 tablets the level of satisfactory with paperwork when visiting hospitals and 51.4% say they are slightly satisfied. Table 1.5 reveal the difficulty with the paperwork and 51.4% answer yes. Table 1.6 assesses the comfortability with providing hospital personal information which is it where 54.1% are sure yes. Table 1.7 is some of the difficulty in finding all medical documents and 70.3% answer yes. 1.8 provides whether patients agreeing on hospital unifying the patient documents and surprisingly majority which is about 91.9% are in favor. There are plenty of problems after finishing the survey. Firstly, we know that nearly half of the participants have to fill out the paperwork of the hospital when they visit. Secondly, more than half of the participants said they have the paperwork problems when transferring the hospital. So, in the end, people find it very difficult and uncomfortable having to provide personal information to a healthcare facility for each time they have to visit. And they need their documents to be sorted digitally so that they can ha have faster access to the healthcare. In conclusion, the current status of gathering data among patients during the COVID-19 pandemic is still slow. 
patients are given a form to fill it, to fill it in or fill it up online at the hospital website, then the data will be collected and analyzed. Apart from storing data, the patients need to say the information clearly and honestly. The information about the current statehood can lead to way of a frog in pandemic prevention. Lastly, there are plenty of challenges regarding access to help of patients and doctors. For the patient side, people rarely have the opportunity to go to the hospital to check up on their current health status as our hospital uses to cure COVID-19. For the doctor side, when they are on duty and accidentally caught COVID-19, they may not be cured properly. And as nowadays, all the facilities are used for patients even extra con, there might not be enough facilities for them. Now, after collecting the data and analyzing them, we have come up with a solution for the problems we've mentioned before. And that is to apply the big data technology into the healthcare industry and turning it into an app that all patients can easily access it. Our idea would be a whole data center with patients' data or electronic health record. And that center is built up into an app where they can have easy access to those records. Now, for example, in Vietnam, there exists an app called the VSSID. It has practically the same function as us, but it only works for people who have health insurance, not people who do service checkups. Firstly, we will contact our local health hospital to test out our product. And then, when the product is finished, we will try to make it national. If you need further information, here are the list of reference for further reading. We are so privileged to have ended this session with such an incredible video presentation from IDC School Thai Binh Duong Primary Middle High School, Vietnam. As usual, if the viewers have any questions or concerns, do voice it out in the chat box. We also would like to welcome our esteemed judges back on board. All right, so there is a question from user Nurul Hanis. They are curious about how do you get together to gather info for your research? Please help clear the air, our presenters. Um, Tony, you want to take this one? Um, thank you for your question. So we get together with each other. Like, uh, I, I, I don't fully understand the meaning of this sentence. However, I'm going to answer with my understanding. Uh, we get together with each other through uh, communication and then we start a Google form and interview to gather our data for our research. And mostly they are conducted online and uh, no offline or physical meeting. Yes. Such a crystal clear explanation. Thank you very much. We have another question that asks, what do you think about the safety of the patient's document online from user Siti Ashira Ismail? Would our presenters attempt to provide some clarification? Oh, thank you for your question. This is the thing that we were curious about and most ambitious about when we were conducting our research because when it comes to the online thing, it is very dangerous to put someone patient document online. However, we came up with a solution for this because um, when we publish our app or our solution, we will come through the government safety, like it needs to pass the sa government safety uh, protocol before it goes on the App Store or the Google Play. Uh, secondly, we have a way to protect the docu patient document that we create the OTP system, what, which means that the one-time password, we uh, that is applied into the bank system in Vietnam you mean like mean when you when you conduct a transaction to someone or someone else uh, it will require you to have the otb code will be sent to your phone to to to to search um, to know that that is you who are doing that transaction but not anyone and we will apply the system in our app to 
because when like when the hospital want to take patient information uh, an otb code is sent to their phone to to certify that that they are giving their consent to the hospital to use their information and um, everyone to um, i would also I like to also add to tony's to answer is that we will also try our best to keep our systems up to date with the current technology. So whenever the next type of ho server host or server plugins come up, we will try our best to keep it up to date to prevent using um, outdated and obsolete technology that will further make the process of being hacked easier for the hackers. Thank you. Such thorough clarifications from our presenters surely has given me some new matter to ponder upon. So moving on, um, does our judges have any um, comments for our presenters? Yes, may I? So I'm just curious, um, is there any reason why you choose your target respondents on the 37 per, uh, people and you only focus between 25 to 40 years old? Is there any significant, any reason why you choose? Um, thank number, you for your question. Number. Okay, yes. thank you for your question. Uh, the reason why we chose the people from 25 to 40 is uh, because of the. We are not choosing them. They are random people. We give the form to. They they are the patients or who who went to the hospital during the fourth wave of COVID, and Ted. Um, I would like to clarify again that we did not pick these people, but throughout the interviews and uh, as, uh, the forums that we gave out, it shows us the statistics that this age range is the, the age that went to the hospitals the most. So we would like to um, make the trip to hospitals more convenient for the all age ranges, but specifically for this because they've seen the most trips to the hospital. Thank you. Uh, is there right. any more judges who would like to give a few words to our presenters? Uh, okay, I have one. Um, do you think that uh, the artificial intelligence uh, would be the next technology to help doctors to remedy patient disease after this? Um, pardon? Uh, do you think that you know about the artificial intelligence, AI? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, things, uh, people, the technology is there. So do you think it will help doctors? I mean, you have you have the system which have the data patient disease, uh, data patients, please. And um, you know, this technology I think will will will help uh, doctors to you know remedy the disease of, of problems on the um, people. Oh yeah, thank you for your question. I, I totally agree that AI will be the next method for the patient and uh, no for the doctors and hospital to predict the next disease. What is because nowadays I, I read about the artificial artificial intelligence on a, on an article, and I'm pretty sure that this uh, a, this technology is the future technology, and I guarantee that. All right, thank you so much for the crystal clear explanation. So we have come to an end to our question and answer session. A big round of applause for Votandan and Tong Duk Tutam from IDC Tai Bin Duong Primary Middle High School for the great presentation and for providing explanations for the audience and the judges. Also, not to forget, we also would like to, to say thank you ever so much to the outstanding judges for the commentaries and interesting questions that for sure has helped enlighten our presenters. Sadly, that was the last presentation of the session, but don't worry, there are a lot of video presentations coming up next during our third session. Last but not least, once again, we would like to remind the audience that there is an online quiz posted in the chat box. If you manage to answer 80% of the questions correctly, an international achievement e-certificate will be waiting for you. The online quiz will be open until tomorrow, Sunday at 10 a.m. So don't miss out. For a clear understanding, let's watch this short video on what to expect for the quiz. Thank you to all the viewers for joining us in this session. Our next session will commence at 2 p.m. Be sure to tune in and don't be late. 
we will be right back. And don't forget to check out the new link for session three from our YouTube channel description or visit our website, persis.sriputri.edu.my. Thank you once again, everybody, and have a nice break.